only a couple of committee members on right now. Um, oh, there's Susan. Um, do we have a um, volunteer to do minutes before we go public? Otherwise, we have a backup plan, but better yeah, to have a volunteer. Members on right now. What? Somebody said something I couldn't hear. Barbara is so far resounding, not volunteer as far as I can tell. <laughs> um, if nobody volunteers, I'll, I'll take the minutes. Barbara's the backup plan, so. Okay. I'm the backup, so that's fine. Okay, so Stephen, I guess we can go public. We could have gone public anyway, but sure. I did go public a few minutes ago. So okay. We are public now. We're public. All right, and we have uh, 19 attendees from the um, from the public, so that's great, and 14 panelists. So, um, so let's get started. Um, Barbara, if it's okay, I'll start and then introduce you, and we'll uh, go right into the meeting. Um, so, this is the Mar the excuse me, February meeting of the Community Board Seven Parks and Environment Committee. I'm uh, Clary Newell, co-chair. We have a new co-chair who's first meeting as co-chair is tonight Barbara Adler and she's going to talk very shortly. I see Mark is clapping. Um, so um, we also have, although I don't see her yet, we have a new committee member, Polly Spain, and we were going to be welcoming Polly at the beginning of the meeting, but I don't think she's with us yet. So when she joins us, we will, we will do that. Um, we have an agenda with several items tonight, but um, the first thing we're going to do is to turn to Barbara for a minute or two to tell us a little more about herself. And Barbara, you've got now 22 attendees from the public who will learn uh, more about you too. <laughs> many of them know you already, but many don't. So it's yours, Barbara. Thank you. Thanks, Clary. Um, I'm much looking forward to co-chairing this committee and working with all of you. Uh, I rejoined Community Board 7 in 2019 However, my first tenure, which was a number of years ago, lasted for 22 years. At the time, I had three young kids, and today I'm a grandmother to five, so time does march on. Um, my first time around on the board, I was co-chair with Andrew Albert of Transportation, and then for several years, another several years, I was co-chair of the Parks Committee with Bob Herman from uh, the Broadway Mall Association, whom I think you probably all know. I left to devote myself more fully to my job as the founding executive director of the Columbus Avenue bid. And for most of my time there, I was the only employee with a large board, uh, about 25 or so, of mostly progressive thinkers. Right away is our first thing we developed a mission statement. And the mission statement was to make our avenue as green as we possibly could with the idea that people flock to places that are comfortable, attractive, clean, and verdant. Oh. So uh, one of the first things I did was to work directly with Jeanette Sadakan, who was then the uh, commissioner of DOT, to get a bike lane on our truck route. And um, at the time, it, it seemed impossible, but we did get the very first one on the Upper West Side. We had a few setbacks, but we eventually did get it and we were the first, and that was very exciting for us. Um, with money that we saved from our Taste of the Upper West Side events, if anybody remembers those, we were able to build our sustainable streetscape between 76th and 77th on Columbus Avenue, on the west side of Columbus Avenue, planting a full block of trees, lots of native plants, seeding, solar lighting, Manhattan's first bioswale to try to solve a, a flooding problem and a lot more. Um, today, those trees tower over the fence, which was the whole purpose of this, the <clears throat> impetus for this project because uh, it's a chain link fence from one end of the block to the other, no stores on that block. And today it's leafy and green and it's uh, really become a go-to place in the neighborhood. Um, I've been on the board for uh, Theodore Roosevelt Park for many years now and the advisory board for the Broadway Ball Association. And I'm also on the working group for the new Gilder Center at the Museum of Natural History. 
Um, I retired from the bid about a year and a half ago, having been there for 20 years and then reapplied to Community Board 7. I have lots of ideas that I'd like to suggest for future agenda items, but I am particularly interested in hearing about your ideas, possibly to expand what we currently do. So that's all I really want to tell you, but I, I did want to make my, one mention of the agenda that we have three interesting presentations tonight, and these are timed items, and this is in an effort to run an efficient and reasonable length meeting. So I really hope that we'll be able to stick with them. And thanks, Larry, back to you. All right, just briefly, uh, two things, uh, how to, one is um, we are, we aside from the people who are gonna be presenters tonight, as always, we welcome Jeff Martin, who is uh, a panelist who is, uh, I see his picture there, who is the uh, ma manager of Riverside Park and Matt Genrich is with us, I believe as well, who is the manager of our parks in our district and the adjacent district that are not Riverside and not Central. Um, second thing is all board members should please in the chat um, put your name and this is really just necessary for board members. It's how we can uh, uh, keep track of, of who's here. So put your name in the chat just saying you're present. And then finally, Mark and Stephen, I have a question for you. I know there are more, I've never seen this happen before on my screen or lack of it on my screen there are 16 panelists and I'm getting 12 uh, uh, squ squares or rectangles and I don't have that arrow that lets me go left or right to, to move and see the rest. Any idea what's going, why I'm not doing that? Yeah, uh, Clary, um, I think you have clicked a button that says hide panelists not on video uh, or something I don't think like I that. Did, but where, how do I unclick it? I don't want to take everybody's time to try to figure that out. Is there a way to unclick that one? If you bring your mouse to the top right-hand corner of the of the thumbnail oh. sketches, there should be a box view? called view. Okay. And then- um, Gallery view is what it's on. Gallery view, and then underneath gallery view, there should be attendee view, um, it, and you probably want follow hosts view. No, I don't or, have those options, and I don't want to take- I don't have that either, Smart. Oh, okay. Seems like oh, now I've now I see Captain Gallagher. Oh, and Polly Spain. Polly, welcome. We have already welcomed you to our committee. Welcome. There she is. Um, okay, right. so I still don't have the way to scroll back and forth, but we won't uh, we won't spend any more time on that. Maybe Wait, just so you know, but... Clary, everyone's fitting into one screen. You may want to count oh. it. And while oh. we're talking, I don't have two screens. You can play around with the speaker view for the yeah. first time. And if you want to text me or, or text Mark, we can sure. help you. Yeah, no, now everybody is in one screen. Um, I think it changed a bit. But OK, great. So Barbara, do you want to start with the first item? Do you want to introduce it? Um, is the, uh, the, um, the, the pool and rink uh, update. We've got Chris sure. Nolan, who's sure. uh, and, and Lane Adonisio, and a third person who is um, Susie Rodriguez, right? Yes, from the Conservancy, Central Park Conservancy. Barbara, do you want to just do a brief intro and turn it over to Lane and her colleagues? Well, I think in this instance, Clara, you might be better at doing an update than I. I have I have a big learning curve to uh, <laughs> develop here. Well, well, I'm not going to say much because this is an update. But in um, in the latter part of 2019 we had presented to us in the community when we were still meeting in person, if we can remember that, um, a very, very major plan uh, to, um, um, to uh, start all over basically at the um, Lasker Pool and Rink in the north part of Central Park. It's sort of the last major stage of a huge project involving the Harlem Mirror, which is that wonderful body of water there. Much, much of the rest of the project had been completed. So um, we saw that, it was a great presentation. We approved it, the other community boards approved it and Lane and Chris and, and Susie will catch you up on the procedures that have happened since then with the agencies. Um, but we had a resolution in um, October of 2019 um, in which we as our community board approved the project, but we had some open questions that we put in that resolution and I've suggested that our committee members review that resolution prior to tonight's meeting. 
Um, we had concerns about uh, that came from uh, really were uh, from community members who were very fond of this facility, particularly swimmers and others who used it had used it regularly. And um, so there were questions about how the lap lanes were going to work. There were questions about something called the bleachers. There were questions about um, how the uh, interior of the space, uh, which is a completely new space, um, is going to be configured and particularly how the, some of the locker rooms and restrooms are going to work in light of the new sensitivity to gender issues. So um, our colleagues in the Conservancy are back tonight to sort of catch us up on what's happened and what where we are now. So let's turn it over to them. Lane, do you go first? I'm going to turn it over to Chris, but just okay. uh, to, re to reiterate what you said, you know, this is, we did do kind of a lengthy, it's a very, you know, involved project and we did sort of a lengthy presentation. So we're not going to walk through the whole, the whole design yet again. So um, this is primarily about, um, you know, a couple of updates and, you know, some more information about the, you know, exactly those things that, that you mentioned that uh, some right. questions that came up. Um, and so Chris will kind of, uh, Chris will kind of familiarize folks and remind folks of the, the overall, but really focus on that. Right. So I'm going to share my screen now. Oh, I've been disabled. I'll need to be able to. Okay. Very good. You should be able to now, Chris. Yes, thank you. Share. Everybody can see the. Yeah, there you go, Chris. Yeah, so uh, I appreciate the time to be here again. I'm Chris Nolan. I'm the Chief Landscape Architect with the Conservancy uh, and the Central Park Administrator. Uh, we're here with Lane. Uh, Adonisio um, and our uh, par partner in design, Susie uh, Rodriguez from Susan T. Rodriguez Architecture and Design. And as, as Clary and Lane said, this is a really a follow up to our uh, earlier meeting where we presented. It was a pretty lengthy presentation where we tried to bring everybody through the background of the development um, of the project and really the, the development of the restoration of the Northeast, restoration of the Northeast corner of the park. This is um, a capstone project for the restoration um, of the North End, of the Harlem Mirror, of the North End, in many respects, a cap and capstone restoration project to the work on the entire park, uh, work which we began working with the city on basically in 1980 when the organization was founded. And it's really grounded in the fact that the Lasker Pool and Rink Facility um, has uh, been in a curated state for many, many years. We went through the kind of background of how it got to where it was and some kind of fatal flaws in the original design and its impact. Um, and as you can see in this bird's eye view coming from the east side looking west, we have restored the entire landscape um, and the mirror itself. The mirror had been kind of urbanized over time. Uh, the missing link, so to speak, um, is the connection between the restoration of the rest of the park, particularly the woodlands, uh, the, ravine and lock um, to this piece here. Um, our presentation today will really focus on the major design developments and addressing some of those uh, comments you had in your resolution. Um, and our design developments really focus, we've been primarily focused on the technical development of the design. The core of the design has remained um, as we had presented it. There are two kind of major buckets of uh, um, developments. Um, one is it relates to the work um, that we had proposed in the Harlem Mirror, which I'll go through. And some of it relates to the work um, on the upper section, the, the kind of green roof area and the level of development up there, all which we believe um, are uh, um, good development, you know, really good developments that kind of responded to comments that we had gotten through community boards over time, our own design development, uh, and comments that we've got through the regulatory review. Uh, let me take everybody through it. So this is the site, northeast corner of the park, 110th Street. Oof. Back for just a second here my sea legs on that. Um, the project site, really, our work is really focused um, on re-envisioning this corner, um, connecting the water course from this side back to the Harlem Mirror, and I'll bring everybody kind of through that a little bit. Uh, we show this every time to kind of show in the scale of the facility. This facility was built in the 1960s. Lane, uh, if anybody has any specific questions, we can answer them about the history. I won't go through that. Um, but the facility was really built, it actually required a significant fill uh, and uh, fill the water body um, and the water course, the historic water course, it was built when the park was built from the pool to the lock, 
um, was put into a culvert in and around it. And there were flooding problems right from the beginning. Um, and it really filled that entire space and broke both the hydrological connection, the kind of natural systems connection, and also disconnected all of this pedestrian circulation. You need to literally kind of go in and walk around um, the actual infrastructure of the facility uh, and some photographs that are going the wrong way. Um, this is a graph we prepared as we really began to study and try to kind of communicate to people in both from a regulatory perspective, how the development of the, uh, how the mirror has been developed over time. And we refer to it, I think, when we presented last time, that there was kind of an urbanization um, that happened uh, in really two big clips. Uh, in the 1940s, the gray line that goes around the outer edge um, represented where the retaining wall was built. It was filled um, and hardened uh, with a stone edge and asphalt pavement right along that edge. And you can see the site where the, uh, the existing Lasker pool is. They literally filled in and kind of filled that landscape, um, that ravine, that landscape with the facility itself. Um, and we have focused a lot on in our restoration work, naturalizing that, which began in the late 1980s um, with our earliest work. Um, and we see this as really the capstone piece in that restoration. And just a couple of um, views to get everybody grounded. This is, uh, you can see how the pedestrian path kind of goes up and it goes right up along the uh, edge of the facility. Our restoration work really went all the way around um, and had a stop uh, there. Um, um, and it's an imposing structure, which you literally have to walk up a series of steps. It's inaccessible um, and you're pinched along this pedestrian path. That is the main entrance to the facility up here. Uh, between the facility itself um, and the rink. And really this is, 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 a, is an example, unlike Bethesda Terrace or some of the other uh, architecture presidents where a facility was built on top of the park as opposed to be integrated into the park. And our design approach, as we presented last time, was to re-envision the facility, maintain the recreation, um, but have it be part of the landscape experience, not a building in the landscape. Um, and then coming from the south side, this is coming through Huddlestone Arch, um, the culvert um, where the water course goes in and goes into a pipe. Uh, there are some just uh, major miscalculations from an engineering perspective of why that's uh, um, uh, problematic. Um, and you essentially walk into the service court um, uh, of the facility itself with the mechanical equipment. Many of the plantings around here we have done in the last um, you know, 30 uh, years to create a screen and buffer to that to the greatest extent we can, but there's really no clear way to get around the facility here. Um, and, you know, this is the view we had presented last time. The scope of our work was really to, um, it is, uh, we established some very clear objectives. Um, it was determined that the facility could not be renovated. It was going to be replaced uh, in its entirety, uh, removed and replaced, re-envisioned. Uh, I should also note the mechanical systems, um, uh, like the refrigerant that the existing system uh, runs on uh, will no, is no longer manufactured and the mechanical systems, uh, particularly the manifold that feeds the ice rink system is kind of well past its useful life. The parks department has, uh, you know, um, done a great deal to keep this facility operating. There was even a period in the fairly recent uh, uh, past um, where there was a concern it wouldn't be able to operate for a full season. Um, the goal was to replace the facility, repair the damage to the landscape, and correct the hydrology, provide the largest pool and rink possible. The idea is integrating that recreational experience in the park, um, uh, remove the physical um, and the visual barrier. Again, the idea is that this should be a complement in part of the park, not lay on top of the park. It's a historic park, as we all know, and that design should be inspired by the landmark itself. Um, uh, the idea that would, the facility should be welcoming, accessible, and environmentally sustainable, um, which is a big driver in our design approach. Um, should serve more park users as it possibly can. The, the way the current facility operates, there's large periods of time between its swimming and its rink operations where it's actually basically shuttered. Uh, and it's just a function of the uh, nature of the way the facility is um, both operated and the way it's designed because it takes so, uh, the time it takes to, to set it up. Um, uh, and then our goal is to really integrate the programming we do here, not just from a recreational perspective, but build on uh, access to the facility as an opportunity to expand the kind of nature-based recreation we do um, at the Dana Center and throughout the North Woods. Um, so a planned view of um, what we had presented last time. It was essentially um, building this 
as I trace out this line, the facility is built into the slope. This is a green roof. Um, uh, the pool uh, was kind of uh, pushed to the east, um, which allowed us to uh, engineer a, a slope to come down from the drive and reintroduce the water course. It used to flow through the middle of this distance between the two drives, flows along the western edge. And our proposal was um, to construct a boardwalk. Our goal was to, again, connect people to the Harlem Air as much as possible. Um, to, to build out into the water body required us to remove the island that we built in the 1990s, build a freestanding um, boardwalk out there, which would provide uh, access out onto the water through a new marsh, um, and the water would flow overland. Uh, and our development really focused on the work here. Um, some of the comments and, and as we designed development, this was kind of an object in space and our work was really limited um, uh, and concentrated in this one area um, and uh, getting down to the kind of brass tacks of the regulatory uh, context. Um, it required us, it, it, it by, from a regulatory perspective, although created access out onto the water, made the water body actually smaller from a regulatory perspective. That um, And was our, we worked work very carefully to see our goal was to, um, to, to increase the scale of the landscape. Um, and it was there a way we could re-envision or rethink that um, to have it be more of an integrated experience through the circulation of the park and not just an object out in the water itself. And particularly the idea that that experience as you come through Huddlestone Arch and around, could it be a more integrated experience? And then the other piece of development is on the green roof itself. And the idea that we had uh, at the time um, we're proposing um, uh, a, a service court coming off the West Drive to service facility, which had an elevator. Um, they created access down there from service. Uh, and we've been able to kind of work out the service access completely from the ground side um, with a very modest kind of pedestrian path up here, which obviates the need for the extra pavement and the level of development and connection to the drive at that point. Um, and we will not need the, uh, the elevator. Um, the building will be completely accessible from this grade here. Uh, and we'll go through some of those developments. Um, so this is our proposal. Um, the idea is that we will be able to maintain the existing island as it is. We've actually increased the uh, scale of the opening, what we refer to as the throat of the, um, of the lock as it empties into the Harlem Mirror. Realistically, uh, from an elevation perspective, I should say, the mirror actually stretches back to here. Um, there's a, there'll be a small cascade here, and we've been able to make that wider. And our goal in all of this, and we've reworked the circulation um, to maintain the existing footprint um, and not require any fill in. And we've pulled the pavilion that we were proposing, the pergola, um, back onto the shoreline. Um, and instead of concentrating the, the marshland we are proposing um, just in this corner, the idea was to stretch it along the south shore. And instead of building a freestanding boardwalk around a series of new islands, maintain the existing island, which reduces the amount of tree removal and earthwork and impact on the Harlem Mirror, um, uh, and convert this pedestrian path um, that was constructed in the 1940s, remove sections of the wall and convert it um, to the boardwalk itself. Um, and uh, I think the, uh, the drawings I'll, I'll go into will really illustrate that. Um, and then up top, um, the idea that our goal, the whole project was is that the park should flow over the building um, the building was really built into the slope, um, and we've just been able to work, um, working with the kind of uh, programmatic objectives, I'm sorry, the, the programmatic realities of operating the facility, understanding the operations more, and developing the design. We've been able to really emphasize landscape over service area and extra pavement and just stretch that landscape across the top, um, removing the elevator and just a modest path that will come in to provide some level of access from the drive and prevent this kind of uh, connection point to the drive and really be able to screen all the mechanical equipment um, uh, to a greater extent. I'll take you through that in a little more detail. So zooming in, the idea that the boardwalk, our existing island remains, um, it's a habitat value to what it is. It was established, it was built in the 1990s. Um, some of the tree removal we're proposing, some of the, uh, the, the, the um, it, uh, I think there would have been 20 trees that needed to be removed to remove that island. And, uh, and it is a kind of um, a well-established landscape. Uh, we'll do some invasive control out there, but the idea is to augment that and build, um, recontour some of the existing sediments to create the aquatic plantings and the marshland plantings. But instead of having it only focused here, stretch that along the South shore. 
um, and um, remove the sections of the retaining wall and have the path that's currently stone screenings be a pattern of screenings to boardwalk back to screenings. I need to show you what that looks like in rendering or an elevation. And where, how did we get to that point? Um, we got to that point by kind of, as we do in almost all of our studying the history of the park and understanding, this is a great shot because it shows our, our, our interest has always been to connect people to the water. Even when we did the work, this is my first project, as I've many, told you many, um, the work on the Dana Center and the Harlem Mirror, there was this idea that could we get people out, introduce boating again? Um, it's a small water body and we're very concerned, we have always been concerned about the operational realities of creating access out onto the water. Um, this is a great shot from the 1920s um, of the impact on that. And our the idea of the boardwalk was a way of getting people out onto the water and the experience of being on the water without the need um, for that, the, the, the scale of the facility. Um, this is a particularly interesting photograph because it's pre 1940s um, and you can see how the water at one time went, there was no pedestrian path on that South shore. The water went right up against the outcrops. Um, and it's something that's always kind of uh, been an interesting idea. Um, could we bring that water back and create that connection back between the water and the natural rock outcrops? Um, what ended up happening in the 1940s is that water side of this, these rock outcrops, a retaining wall was built, soil was put in, and that asphalt path was put in, which we converted to screenings to uh, in the 1990s. And you get a sense of this is the retaining wall. It was built in the 1940s. This is the condition. This is probably from know, 1987 or so, maybe 1988. Um, the wall was put in asphalt right up against the shoreline. It was completely urbanized. Um, our restoration work actually um, went around the Harlem area, removed that retaining wall, couldn't be done on the South Shore at the time because to remove the retaining walls, to remove the retaining path and the scale of the project, um, we, we, we didn't, um, the idea that converting to a boardwalk um, was not uh, uh, considered back then. I'm going the wrong way, sorry. Um, so how does that happen? Um, it's actually a, uh, our proposal, our revised proposal is kind of a lighter construction and has less impact on the mirror. And again, this is, this is the retaining wall from the 1940s, the idea that we would remove it um, down to a certain elevation and allow the water, remove these soils that were added in the 1940s and allow the water to flood back to the existing rock outcrop. And this, and, and particularly in this particular cross section, this is the edge of the, sh of the mirror, what is now a retaining wall with a little bit of turf on top and a stone screenings path become the boardwalk and people will be able to walk out over the water um, and then there'll be conditions where um, we will uh, you know remove sediment but remove sediment to a shallower a shallower elevation which allows us to create these aquatic planting shells which is a, a model we have done in many of our subsequent water body restorations since the Harlem year that the, the idea that we create shallows um, different different conditions on the bottom um, uh, and providing a, a kind of a variety of habitat opportunities. So instead of it being concentrated just in that corner where the water left, uh, um, went from the ravine lock into the mirror, it stretches all the way along the south shore uh, and it will actually be at that intersection also. Um, so what was, um, it allows us to actually make the mirror bigger uh, and get people out over the water. So some renderings. This is the condition uh, in the 1990s work we had done. We had removed the stone that was there. Um, we, we wanted to emphasize landscape as much as we possibly can at that point. Um, so what we did is we created kind of a turf buffer on top of the wall. It's a little tough to manage. Um, and we took out the asphalt path and made it a stone screenings path. Um, and our proposal kind of builds on that. Um, Again, the idea is that we'll augment some of the existing plantings, deal with invasives um, and create uh, uh, marshland and aquatic plantings. Um, and the path will actually span out over the water. Um, and then you'll go back to the path. And looking back, the island that was built in the 1990s, um, we'll do some horticultural work out there to move invasives. Um, oh, I'm getting this. Uh, uh, what is our view back towards Lasker? This is a great image and really shows Lasker um, as an imposing structure, which you know kind of prevents circulation. Um, it is that visual and physical barrier in the park. Looking back on the proposed elevation, 
um, boardwalk, again, out over open water. There are sections where it'll come out over plantings, back to the stone screenings. The pergola um, has been pulled back, um, mitigating the amount of fill into the Harlem Mere. Some horticultural work we'll do out on the island, maintaining the existing island. And the idea that there's a real continuity between the pedestrian experience as you now walk around the berm, along the facility, um, along the ravine, uh, the lock, I should say, all the way back um, the Huddlestone Arch. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to Susie to kind of walk us through some of the developments in the uh, on, on the architecture piece itself. So Chris, will you be able to flip for me? I can. Okay, great. Uh, it's really wonderful to be back to share with you the development. I'm presenting from 75th Street on the Upper West Side. Um, anyway, so um, it's great to be in at my community board. Um, so as Chris said, um, I think everything about this project is about integrating architecture and landscape. So I think what you're seeing as what we presented last time, it's even being more reinforced by really inverting the relationship between architecture and landscape. So we're creating a really grand outdoor room that is framed by the facility and it's, everything about it is completely enveloped with a rooftop of landscape and even the mechanical space, which currently you come through um, Huddlestone and you know, see that which Chris showed you earlier. Next. So I think we have some more visuals, I think that will be even make the concept and the design even clearer to you. These are showing uh, the summertime mode where um, you know, the, the, this is a tremendous pool of more than 26,000 square feet. Um, one of the things that's been really exciting is to work on the development of the pool design. And we will talk about, I'll show you some of the lap lane information in a moment, but one of the things we've been able to do is integrate what's called a zero entry pool. You can see it, uh, maybe Chris, you can point at the Southern um, end of the pool where you, there's actually a one in 20 slope so that really easy access into the pool for everybody. And it, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, we're so excited. This is actually quite a new um, breaking um, technical issue, but I think it will make the experience of this pool tremendous. And the idea also of reinforcing the accessibility. So everything about this level at pool deck level, everything about getting in and through the building is accessible. Next. One of the things, as we've always talked about is this has a now a life that's once the pool is season is done, the gates will open to the public and they'll be able to move in and through this facility throughout the day and creating this outdoor uh, room that's a big open public space. And, um, but you'll be able to move in and through, use the facility for the restrooms, um, you know, grab a cup of coffee, but really enjoy this space, which is currently the minute the pool is finished, so too is your access. So to be able to really introduce this wonderful, flexible outdoor space um, will be, um, again, amazing uh, new thing. And it's all at grade, you know, as you know now, the um, Lasker is up high. So we've really worked hard to bring it down and to make it accessible. Next. And then as you know, the winter time, um, when again, um, different than when you have to have a ticket to move into this area, very similar to um, Lafrac at um, Prospect Park, you'll be able to move in and through this space. You can observe either from the pathway above or looking at the same level, the, the skating and rink and go in and use the facility. So um, I think this is all starting to really gel and um, is exciting um, progress. Next. Okay. So just to, no, that's right. It, it, we just, just to bring us back to summer, we're all hoping for warmer weather um, after this yucky day. Um, so if we go to the next, um, these are just some additional kind of refinements. And one of the things we were, as the questions about just how does this building operate, et cetera, we've been able to at either end be able to reinforce uh, a much better entrance into the building under the overhang. And then we still have this expanse of um, glass with pivot doors. It becomes a front porch 
during the summer with all the glass doors pivoting open. So there's lots of room for shade, um, et, et cetera. And then you move into the building, um, mostly from the north and then move out through, through the porch. Um, the materials, again, this is just a little more refinement, still pretty much the same concept we presented, but we've been working on the development of the stone, its coursing, its scale, so that it has really um, materially sympathetic with the exposed rock outcropping and huddle stone, but obviously a smaller scale stone. Uh, the transparency of the overlook mesh for the railing, um, and very importantly, making sure we preserve uh, the bird safe glass, the Ornolux glass that is part of our specification. Some details of metal, um, the soffit of wood, the interior, which is a, as again, a public porch that has the wood ceiling, but it's also acoustically absorptive. And then you'll see in a moment, a little more detail about beautiful um, glazed tile that we're introducing at both the entries. I think the next view gives that a pretty good shot. So this is a new view, summertime when in, you come into the park um, with beautiful kind of glazed uh, green wall with light and dark greens striated vertically. Uh, you can see the wood, uh, the stone that um, extends from outside to inside and it's uh, skylit above that back edge to bring light in during the day. All of this, um, I think has become obvious to us but underlying everything we're doing is making an incredibly sustainable facility from the envelope, enveloping it in the landscape and all its um, uh, insulation fundamentally by that act. And then the use of natural recycled and local materials through, throughout. And then the glass wall with the pivot doors, they're 14 feet high, five foot pivots with the punctuation of the uh, vertical uh, wood of the columns. Um, so, and you can see the overlook. So next, um, and we've been working with parks too, um, in terms of making sure this facility really functions in accordance with all the uh, requirements, because there are a lot of them with the health department and the parks and making sure this is a really durable uh, facility and one that really they can crowd control and really move people in and through the building. Maybe this is a little more technical in some ways, but you can see how the landscape is the roof. Um, and then um, the section through those large pivot doors, that porch that faces out to the pool, um, large picnic tables and it's for gathering, the stone wall that goes from outside to inside. You can see the skylight that washes down and really gives you the texture and beautiful character of the stone. Um, and then as you go to the next layer, that's the primary circulation. Again, bringing that beautiful um, tile inside. Again, more acoustical ceiling treatment, but wood and then the layer behind with a clear story to bring some grazing of light into um, the locker facility. Next. I, I, this, I, I, one comment I've got before, but as Chris was talking about the uh, landscape as it comes over the building, what's really exciting is I think in some ways, the first, if you arrive from above, you wouldn't even know you're on a building. It will really feel as if that, you know, the landscape and the path and that topography is all just one and the same. So here you can see the inside. I have to be honest, we, we have a great diversity of people, but not in age. It's really hard to find people my age in bathing suits. Um, in, so <laughs> we apologize for, for that. Um, uh, mostly models are only available online for, um, but you can't take photographs at the pools. So it's a little frustrating, but here you can see the acoustical ceiling of the wood slats um, accent and the brackets that bring the light in. Um, and the, you'll see there's certain uh, opening and closing of these gates at the large openings to control access onto the pool, which is very important. You have to have taken your shower and you have to have your white t-shirt and no cell phones and there's lots going on there. Next. And this is just as you move further in that primary circulation space, next. And then um, the questions just about the functionality. Chris, you're gonna have to do the best to sort of walk through since I don't have control, but you come from the north, that's the primary entrance. Then, the pri then you come into the building and um, at, at just right at that first portal. And the red path is the primary circulation where you can be be, you've already been checked at the gate. 
um, but you can be there uh, before you change to move into the first um, set of green, green and blue is the men's locker rooms and chain and toilets. And then the, in the middle, um, we've integrated four gender neutral and family changing facility and bathrooms. And then the next is the women's uh, changing room and, the, and the yellow's the shower. So there's a very prescribed uh, sequence or choreography of how people go in and go through the shower and out onto the porch, which is um, that sort of lozenge shape space and then out onto the deck of the pool. Um, so um, I think that pretty much describes, I can, we can always, if you have more questions. So on the deck of the pool, you know, we have um, really this elongated uh, ellipse shape. And then at the Southern end, we have um, the spray pad, uh, which really is a wonderful, you know, addition. And what's nice is it's proximity to the zero entry into the pool because there little kids can go, you know, take their first step into the big pool and it will be less threatening and really a nice, um, you know, graduation, I guess, from the spray pad into the pool. Um, okay, uh, I think we can go to the next. Um, so these are just a three diagrams. There was a lot of conversation um, uh, with the, the lap swimmers. And so we've come up with this, um, these embedments, it's the bottom um, left corner, but they're actually gonna be put at strategic points around the perimeter of the pool. And that um, will allow for a really flexible arrangement of lap lanes. So if you're a 50 meter swimmer, that can be set up. It will all have to be programmed with parks, um, but you can see running the, the length uh, of the pool from here to there. Next. And then 25 meters, which could run, and this allows different zoning and use of the pool. And then the final is some people are even more specific about this in their need for um, 25 yards or um, so, or 50 yards swimming. So, you know, all of this can be positioned to enable that to happen. And then there are these um, pieces that get inserted uh, basically for the turning to happen. And then all of them are on these um, sort of, um, I'm losing the word, but uh, they're wound up and then they can be stored or left on the deck. Uh, we have parks prescribed lounge chairs. Um, I think uh, they're all there. And then we have um, a, a slight stepped area along that, which is wide enough to lay out and lie. Um, similar, though a little less, um, it's much more accessible because the current amphitheater has multiple uh, steps, which isn't accessible to everybody. So this makes it all accessible, but have one layer all along the Northern perimeter. Next. And then one other big change, we originally, our pool level was down about six inches from the edge of the pool. And so we're able to work with our, the engineers to bring it so it's almost flush. So it's much easier to get in and out of the pool. Your buoyancy makes it much you know, simpler for everybody to get in and out. Um, and so the drainage is along that top, top surface. Um, okay, I think that's good there. And then um, the transformation to um, the winter season and where, as we've always talked about, you know, the pool is infilled with the structure. It's the um, open uh, recreation space for spring and fall, and then the brink with all the utilities and infrastructure coming primarily underneath that level from a permanent uh, location in the mechanical space here, all underground, um, is then um, brought up uh, and built as a, a seasonal facility. Next. And I, I think that the one thing, again, I mentioned earlier, but we really learned a lot from um, LaFrac and seeing what they do and being able to, maybe Chris, you could sort of show the moving all the way in and through the building. So it's through the outdoor space. So you, you can come and wander in. You could, at this point, building is more of a warming hut than it is a porch. And so you have this wonderful gathering space um, and then you have concessions on the southern end and you have skate rental on the northern end. And then um, the locker rooms that are green become much more um, gender neutral, except for the hockey teams, um, because you can, as it is now, everybody can, you know, it's not changing, it's just changing your shoes. 
And then you do have dedicated bathrooms that can be open again to the public. So this is really not just a skating facility, but it's a public facility where you could sit in there and have a cup of coffee, hot chocolate. The menu isn't finalized yet. But um, anyway, it's, uh, it, I think it's gonna be great. And then all the gates get open and it's much more free, free flowing most of 12 months of the year or 10 months of the year. And then all the other nice thing is all the support spaces for the hockey and you know, the Zamboni, et cetera, are all on the uh, Western edge behind um, the structure. <laughs> so that with the planting, which isn't shown here in the berm, et cetera, it's all enveloped and less part of that public visible uh, passage. Next, I think I'm almost done. So here are just a couple more, um, just showing the nighttime view, very important. We've been working with uh, BPI, Branston lighting designers to really think through how we can do this in a way that is much with modern technology that's less blaring. So each column, there's an uplight at each column that lights the soffit. There's the glow from inside. Again, all of these are LED, high performance, energy efficient, dimmable uh, fixtures. And then we've been able to reduce it to four vertical poles. You know, down at Woolman, they're actually seven. I mean, they're really big and loud. And so these are gonna be very, again, high performance, very um, focused, literally, and um, controlled fixtures that will light the skating area in particular. There's some views in a minute. Um, next. So you can just see a little bit, but it's the lighting is super focused on the rink and the skating with just overall ambient light for the zones around. Mm -hmm. Next. And then this gives you um, a sense of beyond the project beyond the open space and the facility is just um, the extension of the Beeple lighting in the park. And so that's sort of a, um, where there is boardwalk, we've integrated the lighting into um, the stanchions of the railings. And then on the overlook where we have benches, um, where we, to try to keep the light down is we have a bollard lighting system um, along that edge as you move across the overlook. Next. And these are just interesting. Those are different. This is summer and spring and fall where the building could be on or off if there's an event at night. Uh, but you really see the pattern of bee poles and the drive lighting. And then next, the, the winter time where the, um, just where you get the lighting um, for this, you know, really focused lighting on the rink itself. Um, so I think that's pretty yeah. much my, I'm finished there. So, so I'll turn it back to Chris. Yeah, just to, to, to take it, um... Uh, to kind of conclude, we wanted to just, we had spoken at the community board meeting uh, about the scale of the project and the level of site development needs to happen to make the project happen. You know, we necessitate significant impact on the landscape and significant tree removal. And we um, uh, have uh, kind of just want to kind of report back at what that is, is as I said, our, our sal uh, maintaining the existing island um, has allowed us to reduce the amount of tree removal that's needed um, in order to actually remove the facility, do the grading it's necessary to bring this back, it will necessitate the removal of 50, 51 trees. Um, we've worked very, very carefully um, to mitigate the impact on the landscape as much as possible. Um, I often refer to this as, as we work through the design. This is a bit of a, you know, there's a surgery that needs to happen. Um, and there's no way to actually work around uh, the, many of these trees were actually planted uh, as a means of screening or have self seeded and grown up there around there. And um, actually we've already begun some of the replanting. There's a series of white pines. We actually spoke about at this meeting um, that we've begun to replant on the other side. Uh, you know, as a landscape architect, as parks people, this is, we're in the tree, you know, this is, we're in the tree business. Um, so this is not something we approach lightly. Um, but the overall impact in terms of the landscape restoration is really significant on the other side of this. Um, in the end, we will plant 130 trees. Um, the character of the landscape, um, the idea um, that this, this berm will envelop the pool, um, um, it's um, uh, completely revegetating the whole landscape just in terms of you know, the green roof going over the top. 
There'll be groupings of shrubs and trees um, with a bit of a dry meadow here um, with uh, herbaceous plantings. The stream course as you go through um, uh, a woodland slope and the idea is to actually maintain uh, and expand the character um, and quality and habitat value of what goes on in the ravine through here along the slope. Over time, it will become you know, densely canopied um, with mature trees. Um, there'll be uh, a bit of an upland landscape with herbaceous shrubs and tree plantings to stabilize those slopes. Um, the island and the inlet, uh, this idea that we would create uh, um, uh, a small, you know, clusters of boulders with soil pockets that be planted with native woody shrubs. Um, uh, and then along the shoreline, um, there'll be some invasive plant control in the existing plantings and an embellishment in creating, uh, uh, you know, the kind of marshland, aquatic and upland plantings along those edges. Um, so just to finish up, this was a view we had shown, the idea that this was the, um, this is the view from his, a historic view that would, one would have experienced as one came through Huddlestone Arch. This was the nature of the vegetation. The Harlemir stretched back. Um, there was a small footbridge across the view to 110th Street and that pedestrian path um, that went around and over the bridge. What became the service court? Um, uh, and the restored view. Um, it's a really significant site development that's gonna happen. Um, we're really excited about the opportunities um, uh, to actually make this project happen over time. The idea that this outdoor room, the facility itself, um, except in the season when it's operated as a pool because of health code requirements actually now becomes part of the park, not a facility in the park, but a facility that services all the park's users, the outdoor space, the amenities of the bathrooms, the space, this, uh, um, and then there's a continuity of the landscape experience of those people walk around the facility um, along. It's all great accessible to the other side of Huddlestone Arch. There'll be a series of cascades and this entirely revegetated section that was once uh, basically that, that masonry wall, um, the vegetated slope, the path, the uh, kind of riparian plantings to the water course up to the engineered slope, which over time um, as it's established Will, will become uh, kind of a, a canopied all the way out to the Harlem Mirror and you'll eventually be open up to the view. So thank you. Everything. This was amazing, Chris. It's an thank incredible you. project. And um, I know there are questions we're already yeah. way behind schedule. So oh, I'm it's sorry. good to show yeah. you. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara, we're just gonna have to be flexible about the schedule. Barbara, if you'd like to do the calling of on of people for uh, questions and comments. What I would suggest is that we try to stick with what we typically do, which is um, first uh, committee members and not and non-committee board members, if, if there are any, and we have just a little time for them. And also then, of course, our community members. Um, we would ask that people, I guess at this point, either comment or question as one or the other, or, one, or both, but not questions first and then comments later, because we're we do need to keep track of time. Um, I have, Barbara, I have uh, actually several questions, but I'm happy not to be the first and happy to turn to you to call on people. Um, right, so mechanics of that, you may need help from uh, Mark and uh, Stephen. Susan? Oh, thanks very much. Um, first of all, it's spectacular. Um, I'm wondering how long the construction, I've got a few questions. Um, I'm up in that part of the park a lot. As people know, I'm all over the park a lot, um, but it looks, really, really lovely, it's particularly what you're doing with the ravine going north, and the whole thing looks fantastic from a birding perspective and a whatever. Um, I've got a couple of questions. How long will the construction take through 2024? And you wanna, um, yeah, the, yes, the, our, our goal, um, our, our schedule is actually to have it open for this pool season of 2024. Okay, um, during that time, um, I know this is all taking place north of Huddlestone Arch, but right now, very often, I, I come into the park from 110th Street and then go south down toward the lock and ravine and go around the mirror um, to check out the heron situation. Um, will you still be able to access the ravine coming north, heading south? Coming north, heading south. Um, from, from 110th going south, will you still be able to go along that walkway? The, the walkway in and, uh, adjacent to the facility will be closed. Um, we'll, we, you know, we will work with, you'll be able to get through um, uh, you, you will not be able to get through Huddlestone Arch to get into the ravine, no. So you'll have to go you know, to one of the other along the drive, either yeah. to, the, to the west or to the east along the drive and enter the North Woods through one of the other entrances to get there. 
Okay, that's great. Um, and then um, another question would be the boardwalk width. Will that be the same width as the current path that's there? It looks like it might be a little narrower. Same width. Yeah, Actually, it's 12 feet. Right now, um, uh, that path is heavily used by um, pedestrians, by bikers, which I think is not supposed to be the case, and then also by people who fish. Um, mm -hmm. So will they still be able to do the fishing off that boardwalk? Absolutely. That's actually part of part of what the uh, uh, you know the idea that it becomes like the other access points on the shoreline. There'll be there'll be points where people can absolutely fish from there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Will the turtles still be able to bask along there? <laughs> yeah. The the oddly strange amount of turtles that there are in the park, but yes, they'll they'll okay. be encouraged. Um, and then uh, one fi two final things. Um, one is the whatever the boardwalk is made of. Will that be durable enough that it can withstand the bikes on there? Because sometimes you even see electric bikes on that path. Well, there shouldn't be bikes. Yeah, there shouldn't be bikes. Yes, it will be, you know, currently, um, we've detailed we've detailed it the same as we were last time. The idea that it would be a wood, a wood boardwalk, steel stanchions, mesh. Um, we're actually looking into development on that, and we'll be back if there's a change on that. Um, we are have an interest towards um, uh, making sure it's as durable as possible, um, uh, and we're, we'll evaluate. We're actually speaking with Parks about the idea that, you um, Part of their encouragement was to look at uh, alternative materials besides just wood, uh, and we are considering uh, a steel grating, um, which would be extremely durable. Um, uh, and if we uh, make that change, we'll be back to report to the board on that. Okay, you might want to consider something like they have in, um, when you get onto the reservoir, where there's like a sort of a, um, a two barriers that are put up, so it makes it difficult to access the pathway. Um, at the start and the finish of it. So the people oh, the chicane, yes, yes. Um, from bike. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then one final thing, um, I, I'm delighted that you're keeping the island because that's a favorite Good. place to see herons and other wild though. This is great, thank you. Um, what, carry on, can we have it right now? Ken. Yeah, Ken, Ken it's Steve. If I, I just want to offer a time efficient solution. I don't know if one of our speakers um, perhaps could go through the Q&A. There's about a dozen questions in there and some of them are very specific. You should have access, and I'm wondering if one of you can, while these other questions are asked, you can answer these questions, and it'll be much more efficient. You don't have ash, uh, access, but it's under Q and A. I'm looking at it. Great. So I'm gonna. So I'll let you go through that, and uh, and then I'll hand it back to Ken. Do you guys, was, Chris and Lane, see those as well? I do, but I only see I think four questions. Yeah, I see four. I see all of them. I, I mean, I see I see a lot of oh, board members saying, down and saying see present, would, but would, not in the chat. You want to read them and you, just answer them according. Do you want me to read them? Sure. Well, I okay. think we're trying to be efficient with time because, and so we're going to have a lot more questions, and maybe someone simultaneously can answer these online. Sometimes I do, but oh. I, can't, I don't have your answers. But uh, well, I think they're probably benefit everybody though. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. I think I think Susie can go through them quickly and, and you slide down to go beyond yeah. the first four. And so none of the artists rend renditions show fences, yet I assume there will be fences. I'm pretty much maybe it's I didn't point them out enough, but if you they're they're all very clearly in there. Like there's a fence all maybe you could flip, but there are fences around the perimeter of the pool, which are required and gates to um so uh, there's you know, required overlook. I think maybe even some of those um, aerials looking down. Uh, anyway, um, the space seating for eating free meals, lunch in the same, smaller or larger as the, sh and that there's gonna be so much space for doing that. And it's so much more accessible. Um, uh, the only control is during the summer, food isn't allowed on the pool deck um, by regulation. That's not by design. How has shade for waiting to go into the facility been addressed? I think that's a really good question. I think we've been looking very hard at the plant material around the, that area to try to maximize shade, but whether we have to introduce more is something that we'll, we'll be looking, studying. Um, then um, Philip Kuhnhardt, is it just the angle or is the women's locker room smaller than the men's? No way. Um, <laughs> any case, um, and it's all regulated, highly regulated in terms of the square footage and how many um, toilets, how many urinals, how many sinks are required. So um, there's somewhat an equivalence in size, I would say, um, but they're all uh, compliant with what is uh, regulated by, by code, showers as well. Um, is there a clock? We haven't located a clock yet. Um, There'll be a clock up there. Yeah, yeah, but we, we just haven't located it yet. 
That's the uh, furnishing. So yeah, that, that will be a clock. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, sorry, I have to keep moving. Uh, why is there one rink, not two? Well, this is a larger NHL sized rink. And you know, the current rink is proportionally um, wider and shorter with two thin rinks um, set within it. So you could break this up into multiple rinks if you would want, but we've shown it as one single NHL rink. Um, where can bikes be locked? We're working on that. Um, whether that, where that prox is proximate, that's one thing we were talking to about with parks recently. So we can get back to you um, on that. And Chris, you might have a answer to that as well. Yeah, that, those, those are, uh, that's a topic we're um, speaking the parks about in terms of, we've had a lot of conversations with parks as the operator of the pool. Um, and we are kind of working on our scheme to locate the specifics of where bike racks would go and the idea that there might be some seasonality to them. Bike racks in the winter, you might need more in the summer months and then the winter months and how that works with the circulation is something we can report back on. Oh, and there was about two, about LaFrac having um, two, a larger for sport and a smaller for recreation. The site of LaFrac is much larger than what we have available to us. So they, what we've really tried to do is maximize the recreation while being able to make this a much more integrated part of the park and to make it actually function hydrologically, et cetera. So again, both for the pool and the rink, we've maximized the, the space. Yeah, um, I mean, we, so. there, was, there was great discussion about that across community boards and last time. I mean, we've, we've maximized the footprint by, um, um, of the facility and it enabled us to restore the water course and address some of those things. It's as, it's as much as we can possibly fit in the space. And then will the same lighting be used for night swimming and hockey? Um, it could be, I think it's operational. The, these are dimmable, but there's gonna be much more low level lighting around the pool perimeter. Um, so, and as well from the uh, building itself. Uh, so but I don't anticipate, I wouldn't anticipate that it would really be those large scale lights or for the winter time alone. Um, again, 130 small B and B plantings isn't enough to restitute 51 large tree removals. So what is the restitution and replacement and plan for tree removals from an NYC forester? So there's, there's not uh, the, um, we're actually not using necessarily all small material um, and we're working with parks now in terms of the restitution. The idea is that this is a massive landscape restoration. Um, it's not like a typical site where one tree comes down and there's a restitution based on a calculation. It's a total line of landscape and, uh, a footprint. If you work for parks, we'd be happy to kind of go into more detail on, on that as, as it unfolds with them. And then what's so got to zip through the rest. Okay. Uh, next what, what will be done to the area where the old pool structure is? This is the area of the whole the site is the area of the whole pool structure. We're building on that once the building is removed. The exact same footprint, yeah. Yeah. Um, what can you tell us about increased noise pollution in the park as a result of the new facility? Where will the music during skating concerts in the past there has been noise and music invading the North Ward walk around Duck Island? Chris, maybe you want to. Yeah, no boardwalk around Duck Island. Um, uh, that that was the, uh, the the significant change. Ken is, is that the idea is that the boardwalk actually goes along here. So the um, in terms of the noise, um, uh, our, our hope is is that through the use of more modern uh, and better technologies and an approach to management, that there that we'll be able to control the level of noise and mitigate some of the the, the bleed out that has happened through uh, you know better acoustic systems. And we've, we're working a lot with our consultants on that. And some of that is a management issue. Um, uh, in terms of how it is. And you know, it is a, a principal objective is to kind of mitigate the light pollution um, and the excess noise as it's carried over. And the, you know, the, the technologies of the speaker system that would happen during a, a skating season are much better than what's there now. We, we believe there'll be a significant improvement. Chris and Susie, excuse me for interrupting, but is there no. a way you could answer these questions in the chat online so that we can move on because we are okay. really behind schedule? Okay. Yeah, some of these are, I think, not really planning, not really relating to the um, 
Yeah, and some of these, I mean, I, I recognize a number of the name, a uh, number of the names like Daniel, and uh, we'll we'll be meeting with the Woodlands Advisory Group, so we'd be happy to regroup. Um, you can come to those meetings, uh, questions about the uh, plantings and some of the details on the water bodies. Um, when will the de demolition begin? That's probably a pretty good question to answer to everybody. The uh, the project was slated to begin this spring after the concession closes, and um, that is still our plan um, to begin uh, late this spring. Uh, questions of operations. Yeah, why don't we just answer those in the chat? I just there's there's other yeah. speakers that are that are waiting to go. It's I don't want to be yeah. wrong yeah. Time thing. I think oh, we okay. need much answer. That's so cool. Ken wants to speak, and there's other people. Let's let's let go of the Q and A. The hopes is that we would type it like we've done in other meetings, but let's get back to Ken. I just want to help out here, and, and there are other people. You know, there, there's a big meeting in front of us, so right. Thank right. you. Perhaps we can let uh, go back to Ken, who I know had some questions. Sure. Okay. <laughs> you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, it look, looks very lovely um, from these pictures. Um, looking forward to it. Um, my question on, on bike parking was answered. Um, I just uh, urge you to um, not go with the kind of uh, uh, very uh, insecure bike parking which where you can only lock your front wheel which mm -hmm. you often see in front of schools or something and the new york city racks where you can actually lock it, potentially both wheels of the bike or or what's ideal um and uh i'm wondering during the off season um between the uh the pool and and the rink what it looked like there was grass over the uh the space and what happens there is yeah, Susie, your slide showed the pool looking in a green color during the uh, non-swimming season. But and I, I have the same question. Will it be an artificial turf? Chris, you might want to talk more yeah, about that. It, uh, well, not synthetic turf like you would see in a field. Is it be more like a safety surfacing? If you've been to the 110th Street playground, the idea that there'll be there'll be a resilient carpet that lays out over that surface, um, 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 which will, will essentially be the uh, the, the final surface. And so people could use that to play. Oh, yeah, I mean, the, the idea is that, that that becomes at grade. So the outdoor room then has, uh, as we presented last time, um, the idea that there's programmatic opportunities um, to do different things there. You know, mm -hmm. children's sports, laying out in the sun. Um, uh, yeah, it's basically a large space um, at grade um, with a resilient surface on top, like safety surfacing. Mm -hmm. And uh, but all year there would be security. Uh, at that entrance? Um, well, the, all year, the facility will be operated. So there'll be security in the facility itself, but there's, there, it's not like there will be a checkpoint there. The idea is that people can move in and around that space like any other spot in the park and go to the restrooms and access the facility like they can the Dana Center or the dairy mm -hmm. or the terrace or any other open and accessible public facilities in the park. Okay, and uh, what was it that Susie you said about white t-shirts being required? <laughs> That's just one of the rules of going into the public pools. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, is that like a citywide rule? Uh huh. Like, so you can't be. You have to have a white t-shirt. It can't be red or blue, and. You can't I, be an issue. I, I understand. I think it has something to do with the dyes. The, the dyes in the pool. Oh, I see. G going into the if pool. If you're in the pool. If you're in the if pool. In the pool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, and in answer, when you're answering um, Susan's question about uh, the path from Huddlestone Arch, it, it looked like you can walk through Huddlestone Arch and walk along the uh, watercourse. Is that true? Or oh, yes, she was asking about during construction. During construction. Oh, during construction. Okay. Okay, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Barbara? What happened to Barbara? Barbara? You know, I've, lost, I've lost you twice, so I really okay. apologize. I had to get on again. Yeah. But, uh, Clary, yeah. please sure. try to be brief. <laughs> May I ask my questions now, Barbara? Yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. I have a couple, and one was answered about the, the green surface uh, during the non-swimming time. Um, the, what is the floor surface in the uh, porch area, Susie? It, uh, you know, I think you're getting a lot of wet feet in there and probably a lot of wet floor uh, during the swimming season. Uh, it showed a sort of a dark gray something in the slide. 
It's a resilient flooring that has a little bit of a cushion to it, so it's easy to clean. And it also transforms in the wintertime to be resilient to skates. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a really uh, great product. Um, anyway, and it has a little bit of texture to it. So that should mitigate slipping and that kind of thing mm -hmm. as well. My next question um, is about the lap swimming. Um, I think it's great. On the one hand, I think it's great that you have this sort of uh, slide right in or just walk right in, no depth change uh, at the one end of the pool, the southern end, I guess, of the pool. But if you're swimming laps, you need a certain amount of depth um, because your arms go down into the water. And you... the so area for I was not going to work particularly with the longer laps. Oh, the area for the lap swimming is free and clear of that. Okay, yeah. great, great. Um, I have two, uh, I guess they're related to each other, technical questions. You guys are not looking for a resolution from us tonight. Is that correct, Lane and Chris? Um, I, yeah, no, we don't. I, I mean, as always, if, you know, anytime you would like to, you know, pass a resolution, that's fine. But um, but it's it's not necessary. Okay. So this then relates to my last question, which is, can you just briefly tell us the status of uh, of where you are with LPC, with the Public, Public Design Commission, whether you have anything still open with either of them? Yep, so we are, um, with the LPC um, has approved, has give their advisory and they approved it. Um, and PDC has a two-stage process. And so the second stage for final approval is us submitting all of the technical drawings, which will incorporate everything we've, you know, we've shown tonight. So it's, um, you know, it's really about um, giving like the spec, the technical drawings and specs and documents um, to get for the final approval. Um, they approved the schematic design um, in March. Thank you. Thank Mark, you. last question. Mark Diller. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, kudos on, on the entirety of the presentation. I thought it was a strong program last time and you've made it better. Um, in the realm of adding without repeating, um, I'll just call out two things. One is I think that the new boardwalk program is so much an improvement over the old. Um, the Duck Island deserves to be its own thing. Um, and I, so I, I endorse that. Um, and then to the extent that there are still an option or an opportunity um, to, to consider it, um, I would come down in favor of two smaller rinks rather than one big one because it presents more options, uh, especially since we've heard from community about the need for hockey programs, youth hockey programs to live um, alongside of or perhaps at the same time as free skating or public skating. So to the extent that that can be accommodated, I recommend it but I wouldn't hold up any approval for any of it. Thanks. Okay. Barbara, I see in the chat, most of the things in the chat are sort of covered already or not really relevant here. Um, one question in the chat from a Nan somebody, uh, if we finish with board members for, for now, what is the capacity of the pool and rink in comparison to the present capacity? I think, I think on the presentation in 2019, uh, the Conservancy answered that, but we can get a quick answer on that. Yeah, it's 75%. 75% of the size to 75% of the capacity. And the next question also, I think, from the same person, what percentage of the pool will be available for lap swimmers? How many swimmers and how many laps will be available at one time, if you know those answers yet? Well, so lap swimming, you know, is a program of the Parks Department. This is a pub, you know, a New York City operated, you know, Parks Department pool. Um, and so the, the Parks Department lap swimming programs are in the morning and in the evening. Um, so, um, and, and basically what Susie showed in terms of the configuration, uh, and that will kind of be worked out operationally, you know, with aqua, you know, New York City Parks Department aquatics and I, you know, I think uh, in, in consideration of what the, what the lap swimmers are interested in, it can be a, a kind of any number of in configurations. Um, those fixtures are kind of around the whole, the side of the pool. And Susie kind of showed a bunch of various possible combinations. You could make the entire pool available for lap swimming. It's really operational. Yeah, that's an operational thing is done by hours. Um, the design actually is, is configurable. Yeah, it's very flexible. Again, flipping through the chat, um, there's a, a general question I think we'd be all be interested in is basically what it amounts to is how has the pandemic and 
in terms of delays and funding had an impact, has it, has it had an impact or where has it left this project compared to where you, it might've been? It sounds to me like you're all systems go. We anyway, are. Yeah, Yeah. no, we, we are. We, um, it, it, there's not a person on the globe that hasn't been impacted by the, uh, the current situation, but we have successfully been able to kind of keep uh, all the approvals and regulatory and technical developments going. And, and when we present the last time, the city had committed its funds um, and we had raised the private funds for it. So it's all systems go on that. There is some, you know, uh, administrative things with the city in terms of registration of the capital agreement, but that is all in process um, and it's uh, full system go. That's fantastic. Um, one other question, I think, in the end of those in the chat. Right, I really need to move on. Yeah, well, how, how does the pool, how often does it reach capacity? What is the capacity? And then we'll move on. Swimming capacity. So um, the, it, it has the number, actually, I, I would have to refresh myself on, uh, but, um, but the, the new capacity will, will be 75% of the existing capacity. Um, uh, the, how often it has reached um, in recent years uh, from the, the pool management, the Parks Department pool managers um, have given us data that um, over the last three years, you know, a couple of times a year over the last three years that it has at some point during the day reached capacity. That just means that you know, at a certain point, the capacity is reached and they have to wait before they can let more people in. Barbara, I think we have largely, but I'm not sure 100% covered between the chat and the Q&A, pretty much covered community questions and comments. If, if, am, I, am I missing something about that? Because we do want to move on. And Mark has it, Mark seems to have his hand up as still, but maybe that's because we didn't lower it. Um, um, I, I'll lower mine. I'm sorry, I'll take care of that. There is one hand raised among attendees. Okay, Barbara, let's. All right, yeah. maybe, maybe Lane or somebody, you, you could please answer that one in, um, in the chat. One Shall, hand I, raised. Shall I unmute the person who's in among attendees? Sure. All right, that's Daniel Tanau or Tanau, forgive my pronunciation. You should be able to speak. Uh, Daniel Tanau, and um, I, I had two quick questions. One was if the um, uh, boardwalks would be drivable. There's some situations where emergency vehicles and maintenance and operations need to get to the south side of the Harlem Mirror. And then my other question is uh, the current canoe launch looks like it's no longer there. Yeah. Is there another spot where the canoe launch will be moved to? It's an important recreation for the city recreation department in the summer to get kids out with the urban park rangers on canoes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good questions actually. Um, yes, the boardwalk will be designed to hold vehicular loads. It's something we've spent a fair amount of time with our uh, operations people to get out there to provide maintenance. So maintenance vehicles will be able to get out there, although it'll be on, a, on an operational basis, not just to drive out there. Um, and the, the current rent, um, boat launch, so to speak, um, is currently in this area here. Um, and um, there will be kind of program boat launch from the pergola, from like the Rangers uh, canoe launch program will, will happen from here and vehicles will be able to get in there. And then the maintenance, uh, we actually work with DEC um, and had, in the past have had a weed harvester that goes out there and that'll be launched from the north side where the set of steps is. Um, so we've maintained access for both maintenance boats to get out on there. Um, and then the kind of smaller craft canoe launches would happen from the pergola and that programming would happen from that point there. Thank you. I'm mm -hmm. gonna jump in here again because we really need to move on. You're more than welcome and very welcome actually, Lane, Chris, Susie, everybody to come back again and discuss the project more when, when we don't have such a heavy agenda. So we're gonna move on to the next item. And thank you very, very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, stop. Barbara, do you want to introduce Captain Gallagher? Yeah, I was just waiting for that screen sure. to get here. There we go. So I am really thrilled to introduce the commanding officer of Essential Park Precinct, 
Captain William Gallagher. Um, we we asked you here tonight be your the, the subject of um, the issues that the police deal with in Central Park, whether or not we have a lot of crime there, whether there's no crime, how many people are actually in the park um, from the from the NYPD and um, and I'm sure we have questions on that and we'd love to hear from you. So thank you so much for being here tonight. And I apologize for the long wait. No, no problem. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, and Barbara, we should, and Captain Gallagher, we should just add on this, on this uh, agenda item that Caroline Greenleaf is with us as well from the Conservancies who is, um, she's the one who we turn to with all of our questions. And um, uh, so she's part of this too. Captain Gallagher. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Clary. And thank you all for extending me an invitation to come and talk to everybody tonight about crime and emergencies inside Central Park. Uh, my name is Captain Bill Gallagher. I'm the commanding officer of the Central Park Precinct. Uh, I've been a New York City police officer for 21 years now. Um, I have prior experience actually on the Upper West Side. From uh, 2005 to 2009, I was the uh, patrol sergeant and the anti-crime sergeant in PSA 6, which covers NYCHA buildings, uh, Douglas houses, Wise, and back then Amsterdam. I'm very familiar with the Upper West Side and it's really uh, an honor to be here and talk to everybody. Uh, as everyone knows, Central Park plays a very unique and a very important role in the life of this city. And I think that role increased tremendously during the pandemic at a time where most people were trapped in their houses under very difficult circumstances. For many people, and I'm sure overwhelming number of people on the Upper West Side, Central Park became a place of refuge, the place that they could get away for a brief moment from some very difficult times uh, during a pandemic and uh, during quarantine. And while that's a tough time, and those were rough times, some of the information that I'm gonna to talk to you today about in terms of crime is good and positive. And we can all use a little good and positive in our lives, especially during this time. So I'm gonna start just with a little bit of a structural overview of the precinct. Then I'm gonna talk about some of the crimes that occur. The first thing everybody should know is that the Central Park Precinct is a fully functional police station. It is absolutely no different than the police station that covers where your home is. So for example, we have the same capacities as the 20th precinct uh, or the 24th precinct. Uh, 24 hour a day staffing, our own independent separate detective squad that investigates crimes, uh, a public safety team, a traffic team, which we'll talk about certainly. So we really have everything that a precinct that covers a neighborhood has, except we cover Central Park. And I think that really gives kind of um, a little, uh, shines a little light on how important Central Park really is to people that we literally give it its own separate independent precinct. So every year police departments across the country are mandated by federal law to report to the federal government certain crime statistics. Uh, we call them in the police department the seven major crimes. Some places call them index crimes. Uh, they're murder, rape, robbery, felony assault, burglary, grand larceny, and grand larceny of automobile, automobile theft. And those are the seven crimes that really give uh, individuals and the federal government a kind of sense of the level of crime and the level of public safety in an area. So in calendar year 2019, Central Park recorded 70 index major crimes. Last year, we recorded 56 of them for a decline of 16%. So the good news is despite the pandemic, despite the fact that more people are actually using the park during the pandemic than they were a prior year, crime went down. And what's really important to note about the crime decline is that crime decline was really fueled by a decline in violent crime, which obviously is the most serious as opposed to property crime. We had a tremendously low level of robberies last year. So like I said, in 2020, we recorded 56 of those index major crimes. Just to give you a historical perspective, in 1993, Central Park recorded 475 index crimes. So that's 475 crimes in 1993 compared to 56 of them last year. And what really is the huge difference is robberies. 
1993, 204 robberies. Last year, 10. It's a dramatic decline. And one of the things that I want to tell people about statistics and context is that I think by reading the statistics, understanding their historical context, comparing them also to last year, um, I really want people to be confident that when they come into Central Park, they're safe. The most important or the most um, numerous situation where somebody is a victim of a crime in Central Park is what we call an unattended larceny. So for example, you may come into Central Park, sit on a bench, maybe you um, wanna go look at something, maybe you're going away from that bench and talking to somebody and you leave your valuables unattended for an extended period of time. And when you come back, they're not there. That scenario represents the single most common scenario of a crime in Central Park. Now, I'm not happy, I don't want any crime, but I certainly, want, if any crime, low-level property crime as opposed to violence. And that remains the single most common crime that occurs in Central Park. Now, that's not to say that we haven't, during the year, had some very, very serious violent crimes, because we have. In June, um, we had an incident late at night at about 12.45 p.m., where an individual was in the mall they saw a, another group of people playing soccer. This person was intoxicated. Uh, a dispute happened. Uh, the person pulled out a gun and shot another individual. Uh, we did what's called a rapid level one mobilization. And through the assistance of Central Park officers and other officers from neighboring precincts, we were able to apprehend the person for attempted murder, place them under arrest, and they were indicted by a grand jury. Uh, that is currently um, going through the legal process. In September, we had an individual where three people who are all known to each other, uh, once again, heavily drinking near the Halleck Nature Preserve. Uh, one of them stabbed uh, their friends and um, there was a subsequent investigation and we were able to ascertain who did that and we placed that individual under arrest. Uh, also during the year, we had a situation where there was a homicide in a county in Florida. That individual fled the jurisdiction in Florida, came all the way up I-95, and was tracked by uh, federal marshals and NYPD fugitive task force, and tracked to the Hexer Playground in Central Park, uh, where we were able to apprehend him safely and place him under arrest, and uh, transport, have him transported back to Florida to stand trial for a homicide. Uh, in Florida. So these serious things do happen. Um, we're very glad that when they do happen, we can uh, apprehend that individual. Um, but I, I, if I could mention just one thing about that particular incident, um, the Hexer playground is packed at that time. And it's packed with the type of people that you think is going to be in a playground, which is little kids all over the place. And you have somebody in there who's wanted for murder and fled from Florida. Um, the actions of the officers from Fugitive Task Force, the Central Park Precinct that day, in order to apprehend this individual safely was nothing short of tremendous. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't tell members of the community about a situation like that, because that's about as serious a situation as a police officer can face. Again, with the fugitive running away from murder. And, um, you know, we took it without incident. Um, there was no uh, exchange of gunfire, no, nothing that occurred in a playground on that day. So really a, a very important day for the Central Park Precinct and for your officers, because remember, they're not the NYPD's officers, they're, they're your officers. They're the people that will come to you, uh, God forbid you need them. So what's next for the Central Park Precinct? Well, we want to continue to keep crime very, very low. Uh, one of the ways that we do that is make sure that there are some fixed posts in the precinct that, that we have. Um, one of them is at the Columbus statue, and I'm sure many of you have probably seen them there. Uh, we assign a uh, police officer frequently right in front of that Columbus statue. And uh, some people may think, well, it's because the statue and there's controversy, and, and yeah, that's one of the reasons. But one of the other reasons that I find basically reviewing statistics, looking at the layout of the park, and just thinking of some basic common police strategies is that where that Columbus statue is, is an extremely visible location in the park. 
Um, if you come into the park and statistics, data, and common sense say that most people enter the park in the South, um, the likelihood of you either A, seeing those officers, or more importantly at night, seeing the lights that the turret lights that they have on, which are very, very visible from a far distance, that you know that there are dedicated police officers there. And I think as a crime reduction strategy, more like a crime, having those officers at that location is very important in keeping the park safe. Um, you may have seen- Gallagher, if I could just interrupt you for sure. one second, because I know people are interested in the Columbus Circle one time. Just sure. to be clear, you're talking about the smaller Columbus statue that's near the, relatively near the Southeast corner of the park, not, not the big guy at Columbus Circle, right? Correct. The okay. big, right. The big, guy, the big guy at Columbus Circle is not um, part of the Central Park precinct. Okay. Uh, I'm talking about the statue by the mall. Yeah. And, and just from, a, from a, a crime strategies, you know, one of the things uh, that, that I do is spend a lot of time is, is reading reports. And I, I don't just read crime reports and 911 calls that as they come in. I go back historically, years, and you can see certain trends and patterns as to the locations where incidents occur. And on that review and that basis, I really think that um, that two officers there is a very, very important part of keeping crime low. And as I tell everybody, like if the Columbus statue wasn't there, I would probably have those two officers there anyways. Um, so a couple of other things that I think are just important to know about the, the structure of the police uh, officers. Um, I get a lot of questions about the number of officers that are assigned to the park. Uh, it's been very steady over the last year, few years, but one of the things that's really happened uh, as of late, which I think is fantastic for us, is we've had a very, very large increase in the number of sergeants assigned to the park. So in the police department, we have police officers, and um, on the street, we have sergeants. You can recognize a sergeant because on their sleeve, they have three chevrons uh, on their sleeve, and they are really the street supervisors in the police department. And... For a lot of people, uh, myself included, I think that the sergeant is probably the most important rank. They're a supervisor, but they're on the street. And um, we are very lucky to have a very large increase in the number of sergeants that we have. Uh, police department rules maintain that we have at least two sergeants on duty at all times. Uh, one sergeant uh, stays inside the station house. They're called the desk sergeant. They supervise the police station. And one sergeant goes out on patrol, we call them the patrol supervisor. In many, many cases in Central Park, you're experiencing shift after shift where there are more than two sergeants on duty and a lieutenant. So I'm very happy to report that, you know, not only is our actual um, manpower very strong in the park, but it also, uh, the supervisors have increased dramatically too. Um, one of the things that I always like to tell community groups about being a police officer, and you know, these are interesting times to be a law enforcement officer in America, no doubt about that, um, is that being a cop is not just all about like the stuff you see on law and order, like you know, violent crimes, writing tickets, stuff like that. A lot of the stuff that we do deals with things that have nothing to do with the enforcement of the law. And one of the best examples I can give very, very recently is an incident that occurred at the Central Park Zoo. Uh, about a month ago, we had a woman and a, a four-year-old at the zoo. Uh, they're looking at an animal and the mom turns in one direction and then all of a sudden, four-year-old's gone. Um, don't know where they go. Uh, so she calls 911 and we initiate a very, very large rapid mobilization to find the child. Now, um, that includes uh, bringing in a large amount of police officers from all over. It includes bringing in our NYPD helicopters, which I, I would definitely like to discuss um, today with everybody, uh, and bringing in canine dogs to um, you know, try to get a scent. And I'm very, very happy to report that we were able to find the child safely, literally on the other side of the park, very far away from the zoo, but we found them. And this was not an incident that had anything to do with a crime, right? The kid was not abducted, was not a criminal matter, but what it was, was a very, very serious emergency. And so often when we think of the police, we think of crimes, and tickets and stuff like that, but a significant amount of what we do 
is handling emergencies that really have nothing to do with that. And um, that's one of the things that I always like to remind people um, about policing is it's not just arrests, it's helping people, helping people when there may not even be a crime involved. Um, so it's been my pleasure to, to talk to you tonight and just give you a structure and an overview of what's happened in the park. I would be really uh, pleased to answer any and all questions, whether it be about the Central Park Precinct, whether it be the NYPD, law enforcement, uh, whatever you feel uh, you'd like to ask a police officer, I'm open to talking and listening and having a conversation about law enforcement and Central Park. And I open the floor to anybody who'd like to talk to me. Thanks very much, Captain. Barbara, do you want to again uh, call on folks? I'm, I've got some questions, but I'm happy to wait for others sure. first. Uh, do we have hands up? Sure, Ken, why don't you go first? Ken? Yeah, sorry. Hi, Ken. Um, hi. Um, a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the, um, one thing I, I noticed that um, 100th Street, uh, the entrance uh, barriers have been um, shortened quite a bit. Um, uh, so you could literally drive a truck through them. <laughs> and maybe that's the idea. Um, but is uh, do you know about that? Is that something that's going to become standard and do you consider that safe? I, I, I actually don't know um, enough about that. I, I, I wouldn't, are you talking about on the east side or the west side? Uh, west side. West side. I, I, I don't know if, if that's done for, for maintenance purposes or to, to drive a truck, I, that I'm not sure of. Okay. Um, I, I, I do know that, you know, um, one thing about that, obviously uh, most vehicles are prohibited from the park. Uh, obviously, there's exceptions for maintenance and emergency vehicles. And I can tell you that very, I would, I would probably venture almost zero vehicles other than conservancy vehicles, scheduled delivery, and police vehicles ever get in this park without being stopped by a police officer. Because mm -hmm. it stands out every time we see a car in this park. So uh, I can tell you that um, when that happens, you know, they get pulled over by cops. Okay. Well, before your time there, a couple of years ago, a guy came in about 11 o'clock at night going about 60 miles an hour and uh, ended up killing himself uh, near Columbus Circle. Yeah. I, so, I, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. So it does happen. Um, I, and uh, so my other, another question was, um, uh, I've been on the board now for 12 years and I've seen a lot of commanding officers of the Central Park Precinct. <laughs> Um, and uh, there have been different philosophies about how to enforce the rules on the, um, on the drive uh, for cyclists. Sure. And um, some uh, have treated the drive as, uh, with the red light, with lights and such as a, as a city street and haven't seen a difference between that and a recreational space. And others have looked at it as a recreational space and treated it differently. And uh, that's been more the uh, policy uh, recently, I've noticed. And uh, the policy <laughs> has, has generally been um, not to um, uh, systematically enforce uh, red lights all the time, but to more enforce failure to yield as being the most important uh, infraction. Right. Um, so I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Sure. Um, I, I do think, and, and prior to prior to me becoming the Central Park Precinct, I should mention that I was the XO of the 19th Precinct, which traffic safety was a tremendous, tremendous issue on the, on the east side. Um, my, my philosophy is this. I would say that failure to yield to pedestrian is probably the most significant violation that can occur. The one thing, though, that I, I hesitate from um, uh, a law enforcement perspective is a kind of a one size fits all approach. Um, I'm very, very leery right now. And I think a lot of our officers are about potentially issuing large amounts of summonses during a difficult time in people's lives. I don't know how many people out there are unemployed. I don't know how many people out there are struggling. Um, so for me and personally, and I think this is something that mostly officers feel when we see somebody engaging in some type of violation, particularly on a bicycle in the park, that 
pulling them over, giving them a verbal warning um, may be the most fair and equitable thing to do given these times. Um, you know, people don't become cops to, to write summonses. Uh, we become cops because we want to make a difference. We want to stop violence. So I really kind of like to leave that up to the individual police officer and what they see in front of them, as opposed to a one size fits all policy. I would, I would really hate to have a situation where we pull somebody over for any one of these bicycle violations, write them a $125 summons and them being in tough times personally and financially. And when we could probably have the same impact and correct the behavior simply by pulling that person over, giving them a verbal warning and sending them on their way. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Stephen Brown doesn't have a hand to raise. So Stephen, you're next. Well, th thank you, Barbara. Here's my hand. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to meet you, Captain Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you um, I'll be, my question was just more, um, you talked about sort of walking the beat, you know, or walking around. And, uh, you know, I've seen, I'm just curious, you know, are there, are there, do you have, do you have people walking around? I mean, I do see them in the cars. I've seen the Columbus at the Columbus statue. I'm just curious, you know, do you have a particularly a busy Saturday or Sunday or any day, you know, policemen walking up and down the mall as a beat. I, I think it's a good optic. I think it's good in terms of relations. Yeah. Um, and I'm just curious if you could share on that because it's, I think it's, it's positive for multiple reasons, particularly about community, you know, community building as well. Sure, it absolutely is. So when there's a large group, uh, when we know that there's gonna be a large group in the park, let's say a concert, um, a large gathering, whatever, whatever event it is, we'll deploy officers on foot as opposed to the car. Um, so like if there's a, a concert on the mall or something like that, that's when you will see the officers on foot. I, I believe very strongly in, in foot posts. Um, I think for all the reasons that you said, uh, the one issue that we have sometimes with that is if we don't have that officer in a car and there's an emergency far away, um, then they may not be able to get them and they may not be able to get there. They may not be able to assist an officer that comes in, especially since the park in terms of geography and policing in New York City is extremely large. So if you... Uh, you know, I, I have the map of the 20th precinct and the 24th precinct in my head. I don't know, I don't expect everyone else to do, but the park is basically as big as both of them put together. So where there would be two precincts in that area, there's one for this area. So I do get concerned about, say a police officer in Swan Lake near 59th Street, and then a 911 call coming up on 110th Street because that's a pretty big distance for them to get. So when we can, I, I, I think the foot posts are great, but we have to also be careful about that distance issue. I understood, and, and I, I thank you for clarifying that, but I, I would just encourage even on a nice Saturday or Sunday, even if they could just park the car and Absolutely. walk out into the middle, I bet you get a lot of people want to shoot pictures with you. Maybe that's Absolutely. a good reason. <laughs> Absolutely. But, uh, you know, not just for concerts, but perhaps a Saturday or a Sunday or, or a busy day. Absolutely. You know, I think it's a good optics and I think it's good community building. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. Clary. Yeah. I'm going to try to put together a sort of a couple of things in one set of questions sure. here. Sure. Um, also, I know, and one of them, uh, we've got couple of things going on in the Q&A. Well, we need to get back to that. But somebody in the chat, and this somewhat relates to what I wanted to ask about, says, what are the most dangerous places in the park where violent crimes are dealt with? Um, by way of very quick background, at our last meeting last month, we had on our agenda a preliminary discussion of the possibility of security cameras in Riverside Park. Okay. There had been a, a series of completely different independent crimes in Riverside Park. Um, where at least some of us thought that security cameras might have been helpful in either preventing those crimes or identifying who, who did them. Um, we didn't go anywhere with that uh, last month on Riverside Park, in part because people wanted to know a little more about Central Park and, and, and where, whether that's whether security cameras or something that's being discussed or considered or would be useful in Central Park. 
So between that meeting and this one, I did have a little bit of correspondence with Caroline Greenleaf, who was with us tonight, said that there's been some discussion, she said there's been some discussion in the last couple of years about the possibility of Central Park. So if I can now try to put this into a couple of questions. Sure. Um, it, are there areas in Central Park where um, security cameras, first of all, could be helpful um, in deterrence or worst case catching folks? Second, would that be helpful in um, relieving you of needing to have actual officers stationed in places so that they could be de um, deployed more, more generally around? Um, and third on that, I guess, what is the status now of any discussion? And I know it would not just be you, Captain Gallagher, it would be the Conservancy and the Parks Department. So I guess that's one set of questions and then I've got a, another set, but let's stick with that one for the moment. Mm -hmm. What can you tell us about that? Um, I, I, I've, I've been, like I said before, a, a cop for 21 years and, and cameras have changed over the time substantially. Um, and I think that the, that the true value of a camera is investigative rather than suppressing of crime. Um, it is when a crime happens and we can use those cameras to kind of uh, find out who did that, who, who, who committed the crime. So I don't know that necessarily crimes would, would change kind of how many officers we have or where we put them. I think it would make uh, a detective's job easier. And um, that is what I think the major value of, the crime, uh, of a camera is. Um, in terms of the cameras in the park, uh, there are cameras, NYPD cameras that circle the park. They are not secret cameras. They say NYPD on them, they're very big, and they're all around the entrances and exits to the park. I would never say no uh, to more cameras in Central Park. I think that that's certainly a, a, probably a funding issue more than a, 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 an opposition issue by anybody. But I think that, that the question with that is funding. I would never say no to more cameras. Um, I would always advocate Central Park over Riverside Park. Don't tell Inspector Yaguchi I said that. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, in, in terms of that, and one other thing about the cameras, if I, if I may, that I think would be interesting to everybody is uh, every person assigned as a police officer in Central Park, and I mean everybody, that includes myself, is equipped with a body-worn camera, uh, every single one of us. So when we go to a 911 call, we have a camera and we record ourselves. And um, it really is a, uh, a game changer in law enforcement. It's a game changer for investigation. It basically shows the truth. Um, it shows what happened in incidents and every single person wears it and including myself. So um, I just, you know, I didn't get a chance to mention that earlier and we're talking about cameras. So I, I want to uh, just mention that to everybody that Every arrest that we make, uh, every time we pull over a car, it is all recorded on body camera. So I think, I don't think we want to go too much more deeply into the camera issue now um, because we have other things to talk about, but I think we will want to follow up um, on our Riverside Park discussion about cameras and, and this one as well and looking forward toward, towards the future, see where that can take us. Um, but we don't need to do that now. My other question also overlaps a little bit, and that's about the Columbus statue where uh, you have, um, I had noticed at the time of the Black Lives Matter protests and when suddenly people were very somewhat overlappingly, but not identical issue, interested in tearing down statues and interested in, in vandalizing or tearing down Columbus statues all over the place, all over the country. So I've kind of watched that site since then, including yesterday. So yesterday, um, what it, it looked to be is that, first of all, there was one patrol car that was covered in snow, had not been um, cleared of snow So uh, at that site. So it was not probably deterring anybody because it looked as if it had, wasn't, didn't have anybody in it and couldn't right. have gone anywhere. Um, is there a, a kind of a little booth now that's been built there? I mean, I, I can understand why that is a good site to have kind of regular surveillance anyway, regardless of whether anybody might want to vandalize the Columbus statue. Um, but a couple of questions. When we were first looking at that site in the spring, uh, the, the officers had their motors on the whole time. And we have a lot of concern because we're also the environment committee 
about um, gratuitous use of um, gasoline powered or engines or for that matter, even electric engines because they get their energy from somewhere that's largely environmentally renewable. So I wanted to ask a little bit about the actual specifics there, um, how, what's going on with the use of engines, what's going on with the use of officers, what's going on with, how can you minimize the various costs uh, while at the same time uh, doing useful surveillance there? Sure. Um, Sorry, it's complicated. No, 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 it's okay. Um, the, in terms of, of costs, I mean, I, I, I have to be honest with you, I, I've never thought about the, the, um, the costs of, of the gasoline on the cars. Um, I don't mean just the dollar cost to buy it. I mean that it moves the car 24 hours a day when there's motors around. Yeah. Um, I, 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 our, uh, that would honestly be probably no different than every other car that is used in the Central Park precinct. Like we, we have a set of cars and the cars are passed from one shift to another. So for example, let's say we have seven cars on the day tour. Those seven cars are operational at 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Our shifts change and the next shift jumps into those seven cars. Uh, so those seven cars literally don't stop 24 hours a day, um, which really gives our cars a very, very, uh, well, a not long lifespan, to put it mildly. Um, the lifespan of a police car is like three to four years. Uh, and that's because it just never stops. It never gets turned off. Um, okay, and I, I, I know we wanna move on with other questions, but I, I don't think they really address the question of having a car just sit there or more than one as we saw in the spring yeah. running its motor when that didn't seem to have anything to do with how should there be a vandal or a criminal well how that person would actually be um the, the apprehended the, the officers also um do and can respond to a 911 call that's in their vicinity as well there so i mean they, they need access to a vehicle but do they have to sit there with the motor on the whole time 24 hours a day yeah, I think they do. Yeah. I mean, also, I, I, I definitely during a, uh, during a weather like this, I, I, I definitely want the officers to have heat. Um, or the, or air conditioning in the summertime. We have two related questions in the chat, if you could yeah. answer them. Sure. sure. Were you not finished, Clary? No, I, 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 I have to say, with all respect to Captain Gallagher, I don't find that a very persuasive or satisfactory answer, but with total respect. So uh, move on to others, Barbara, please. Okay. All right, thanks. Um, if you could answer these um, pretty sure. briefly and then we will be finished, I think. Sure. Um, is it possible to reduce the footprint of police cars, personal vehicles in the car, in the park? I, I, I would have no idea how to do that. Okay. Is it possible to request that police officers use other forms of transportation in the park besides cars? And he, he mentions that he's often seen police officers going at high speeds through the park on back sidewalks and or on the Central Park pedestrian bike path. Thank you. Um, I mean, there, there are times as a police officer, you may have to drive fast. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of anything about a personal vehicle. Uh, our officers work very, very long hours and odd hours too. Uh, sometimes getting on public transportation just doesn't fit your shift. Uh, I would never tell a police officer how to, how to get to work. Um, if a police officer wants to drive to work, that's their personal life. Um, not something that I think I can regulate. Thank you. Um, Daniel Atha asks, would more foot patrols help deter and mitigate crime? Sure, I would. I, I definitely, like I said, I think, like I said before, yeah, the, the foot patrols definitely do uh, when the park is crowded. But at uh, a time like, let's say, right now, where the, if we are out there in the park right now, park is relatively empty right now, and um, having them in the vehicles able to get from one part of the park to the other uh, in a quick distance, I think, at like something like now, is probably the best public safety strategy for police. Okay. 
Philip Cunhart wants to know if there's a plan to transition to electric vehicles if the cars if the cars have to be on 24 hours a day. Um, I think that they there there has been discussion in the police department about electric vehicles. You'd have to forgive me. I, I I'm not really sure how electric vehicles work, um, but uh, I know it's been something that's been discussed in the police department. Yeah. Okay, and the last question, uh, Michael Rosenberg, how can I find out more about the laws around access to public surveillance footage and body cam footage? Um, if you go on uh, the NYPD's website, uh, which is nyc.gov backslash NYPD, uh, off the top of my head, I believe there's a discussion about body-worn cameras on that page. Um, I also think that there is a NYPD federal monitor page that discusses the body-worn camera program. Like I said, we, we all are mandated to wear the body-worn camera, myself included. Um, and in talking with our officers and my own personal experience, I think it's great. I, I, I think it's an absolutely fantastic tool. Uh, it shows everything that a police officer did and everything that a police officer did not do and creates a record that anybody can see the incident uh, occurring or not occurring. Okay, that's that's it for us tonight. Captain Wait a minute, Barbara, there's a bunch in the chat. I mean, we, this is, for some reason we're going both Q&A and chat, but there are a few in the chat that are different. I know, sorry, but we, we're going to need to move on now. Real, real quick, Barbara, there's a question from Ken no, Chan about the dogs off leash. Um, if the captain would mind talking about that for just a brief moment. Sure. Um, what was the question? Just about dogs off leash and um, what your approach is to that, given the recent Chris Cooper problem last year. We all know Chris Cooper pretty well. Just yeah. Just talk about sure. the plans for dog off leash. Okay. Sure. So uh, dog off the leash, as you all know, is against the law. Um, we have uh, Parks Enforcement Patrol also assists us in doing that. And um, I, again, parks, a dog off the leash is also uh, something that um, the police officers, when they see it, try to give somebody a verbal warning and put that leash back on before giving a ticket. Um, and uh, PEP does write summonses and PEP does do regular enforcement on, on dog off the leash. Barbara, there's one completely different question. I think we would find it useful to hear about just quickly, it's, I don't know who asked this question in the chat. Um, it's about homeless people in the park. And this person in the chat says, um, hardly sees any, uh, which is certainly different from Riverside because we see them there. Um, and a uh, person says, whoever asked is curious if it's rare to see any there, are there regulars? In Central Park? Yeah, uh, in Central Park. Yeah, yeah, there are. Um, there's definitely a population of, of, of homeless people who come into the Central Park and use it. Um, there have been some sad incidents over the last couple of months of individuals who are homeless, who uh, happened to, to pass away inside the park, a very tragic set of circumstances. Um, there are a, a homeless population that do come into the park. Uh, candidly, based on a review of the statistics, I can't say that they are the cause of a substantial amount of crime in the park. I, I just, I, I, I don't have the data to support that. Um, homelessness is not a crime, but a homeless person can commit a crime. So, um, you know, the fact that somebody's a homeless, homeless person, we have to treat them um, with respect and within the law. And, you know, we don't want to make their lives worse. Um, but at the same point in time, if they do commit a crime, we, we have to take action. But I, I, like I said before, I honestly, at this point in time, and things can change, I don't see um, homelessness in and of itself as being a driving factor in crime in Central Park. Captain, are there particular areas in Central Park where homeless people, whether in groups or individually? Or in yeah, um, it, the, the, there are places. Uh, 72nd Street in the area of Strawberry Field seems to be one of the places where we see uh, homeless, more homeless people than not. The other thing is um, Central Park is much larger and there are places where you can be a little less viewed as opposed, I think, to Riverside Park. Um, but, you know, 
our, our, our homeless situation in Central Park, I think at this point in time is probably best addressed by social services, um, by people giving them help. Um, I, I don't see at this point in time, like an issue in terms of crime. Barbara, there's a completely different one in the chat again from Phil Conhart, but it's up to you if you want to just not do that one. I have a question too. Sure. Oh, sure, Doug. Doug, you want to ask a question? Yes. Uh, so, hi, welcome, Captain Gallagher. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I know we have a, a busy agenda, so I'll make my questions real quick. Sure. Um, this is just a simple question, and perhaps it's even known by some of my board members. I don't know. And regarding crime statistics for major crimes and index index crimes, um, are those based on uh, convictions or arrests or both? No, neither. They're based on uh, a citizen reporting it to the police. Okay. So in other words, if someone was arrested initially as a felony and it was plea bargained down to a misdemeanor, it wasn't, it, it originally was, the arrest was an index crime, but then it, be, it became a non-index crime. It, it does not get changed. Um, so yes. And that's a great question. And, and actually that's a fantastic question. I, I've actually never been asked that, which is, uh, no, it's an important question. So for example, um, let's say somebody gets arrested for felony assault in, in, and felony assault is, um, injuring somebody um, with a serious physical injury, which is like a broken bone or using a weapon on somebody. So uh, the example I'll give you is two people get into an argument. One person takes out a stick and hits, hits the other person over the head, okay? Um, whatever the initial complaint is, is what our statistics are. So in that situation, let's say there's a trial and let's say for argument's sake at a trial, a year later, that person is acquitted of the crime, okay? That does not change the statistic in the NYPD. It is basically the actual complaint issued by a police officer the night of the incident. Thank you. Thank you. Great, I, great, uh, great question, by the way. Thank you very much. The only other point I wanted to ask you was um, the a couple of years ago, we uh, became aware that uh, the 20th and 20, uh, 20th, 20th and 24th precincts were in need of, uh, the, of breathalyzers for DWEs. And um, we actually were able to uh, come up with the funds and get them to both the 20th and 24th. So really the question I have for you is what can we do for you? What do you need? What, what can we advocate for? How can we help you? Well, you, you know what, in all honesty, um, and this may be a little unusual to ask or unusual to say, but the next time you see a cop, go up to them and thank them. Because let me tell you something, this is an extremely difficult job, no matter what the climate is, no matter what the times are. And I gotta tell you something, the people that I've worked with here in the station house, they, they literally, and I mean this, will, will put their lives on the line for complete and total strangers. I can give you an example today, if I may. Um, right before uh, I came on here, uh, we went to a 911 call of a man with a gun on uh, 110th Street, just outside the park. And this entire precinct emptied out and went out and, and backed up the 28th precinct. And the guy had a gun. And every single person went out there ready and willing to get that gun off the street. And that gun was gonna be used against a complete stranger. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the type of thing that we really don't, most people don't see on a daily basis. And um, I wish we would, tell more people about stuff like that. So your support, um, you know, we're not perfect. Like cops do things wrong. Of course they do. They're human beings. But 99.9% .9 of the time, they are out there literally ready to give their lives for a complete stranger. And I think about the, the 12 people that ran out here today. Every one of them has, has a wife or a husband. Every one of them is a child. And they're driving through the park at high rates of speed putting themselves in a situation that everyone else is running away from. So, you know, if I may, that that's what I would ask people to do. And that, that would mean a tremendous amount to the cop and the beat. That's very nice. Okay. Uh, totally support okay. that. Phil, Phil with your last question, you can contact me separately about that. I think the answer is, is no zero, but, we, but let's move on and you can contact me separately. We can talk about the smoking in the park issue. separately. Sure. Um, Unless Barbara wants to have uh, get an answer from Captain Gallagher. 
Sure. I'll, well, I'll, what was the question? Smoking in the park? Well, the, the question that was posed is uh, from Philip Conhart of the community. Uh, I regularly encounter people smoking in the North Woods and, and other more hidden parts of the park. What is being done to enforce clean air regulations? Meaning, I think in this question, uh, smoking. Um, well, it would depend. I mean, if we're talking about cigarettes or are we talking about marijuana? Um, this question doesn't say one way or the other. But question doesn't say. Cigarettes. Okay. Well, just as an aside, I think it's important to note, and I don't want to take more of your time. Um, in New York City today, um, we do not arrest people for smoking marijuana. We issue a ticket. If it's a kid, we exercise our discretion. Uh, you know, you don't want to put a kid in handcuffs or smoking weed. It doesn't do anything for public safety. Uh, every 16-year-old kid, and we were all 16 once, does things that we shouldn't do. So um, if the question's about marijuana, I think it's um, enforce the law fairly. If the question's about smoking, um, I actually, to be honest with you, don't see very many people smoking cigarettes in the park. Um, I don't know if my officers do or not. Captain Gallagher, I can't thank you enough. I'm oh, sure thank you. I was very, very grateful that you were thank here. You. We'd love thank to have you all. Again. I'll agree with that. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you all. Have a good Thank night. You. Thank you. And invite me back, please. Thank Absolutely. You. No Thank question you. about it. You can become a regular here. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night. Take care. Bye-bye. Dan Kellogg, I am so sorry. <laughs> Dan Kellogg is the president of Young Concert Artists. I don't know how many of you know this organization, but I, through um, a high school friend of mine, have had many years of listening to their amazing artists, their incredible concerts. Uh, it's a 501c3 not-for-profit uh, corporation that brings young concert artists from all over the world to this country each year, gets them recording dates, and I'm going to let him talk about it, but needless to say, um, the pandemic this year has really left them with a lot of incredible uh, young protégés and, uh, and artists, and they have no place to perform now. So that's why he's here with us tonight. And welcome. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. It's so nice to be here. Thank you, Barbara. Um, <clears throat> I can keep it probably pretty short, but <clears throat> forgive me, the second I start talking, I need a little water. <laughs> Um, yes, many of our artists are just fledgling sort of stars in classical music. They come and begin working with us as young as 18, 20, 22. Some of them are at the end of their um, sort of college training. And we are celebrating our anniversary season this year and have a virtual um, celebration planned in May. And we had the idea that it'd be wonderful to try to find a way for our artists to do some outdoor concerts in the city this May. May tends to be a time when the weather is better for outdoor concerts. And um, it's something that we can supplement their fees. We're just looking for good places where they might be able to play concerts. And um, the park would be one amazing opportunity. We have several instrumentalists that can play without piano. Um, I actually just brought a short, let's see, am I allowed to share a screen? I was gonna show a my share screen function works a little slowly, but um, let me see if I can find the document that I was gonna share. Um, anyway, we were just have three artists that are available. Are you seeing that? The picture of the- Yes. Yeah. So we have a violinist there, Subin, double bass player, Xavier Foley, and a clarinetist, Narek Ard Aratunian. And um, just would love to organize sort of some short, 30 minute programs and could work with sort of a, a location where a concert could happen a few times across a single day, maybe once at noon, once at two, once at four. And um, yeah, just really just here to uh, pitch the idea, see if there's interest, see if this is a, a committee that could help make something like that possible. Barbara, what, what further can I tell you? Well, I, are, you, are you looking for a walk-by venue or are you looking for, uh, you know, a, a band sure. or something? So we're open to whatever is possible. If the band show was not currently under construction and that was a possibility, that would be 
you know, an ideal location. Um, or if we're looking at other parks, you know, Marcus Garvey obviously has that, um, their own clamshell or bandshell structure. But at the same time, just having permission to be in a setting that might be good for a concert, um, depending on the day that it's done, even without any advertising, you could get quite a nice walk by audience that might enjoy a 30 minute, you know, violin concert. So, Dan, Dan, I think the people who could be most helpful to, to you have just left our meeting. It would have been Caroline Greenleaf and Chris Nolan from the Central Park Conservancy who could tell you a lot more about how that works than we can, but I think they're gone. Okay. Um, so yeah. For us, it's new territory because we are <clears throat> in the past so married to concert halls. And as okay. Barbara mentioned that um, even though we've actually streamed, quite a few concerts this year and we're still partnering with organizations like the Morgan to bring free concerts to people online through YouTube. We would love when the weather gets better to actually have some outdoor music. And it could be in the park, but it doesn't have to be. I honestly don't know what other sort of realms this committee connects with publicly. Um, you know, obviously on the Upper West Side, there are a number of locations that could work well for a small, small concert. Dan, have you contacted Riverside Park Conservancy? No, we're just beginning to put out feelers and for me to attend. I certainly meetings. recommend that you do that. I know that each year, I mean, the, with the pandemic, who knows? Uh, I, I think a lot of things have not happened as they normally do, but there are typically um, at certain areas in Riverside Park, regular concerts at certain times of day, certain days of the week, uh, throughout some of the summer months, and then other individual special events as well. But your best bet there, um, because we certainly have a very culture interested, music interested audience in the Upper West Side. Um, talk to the Riverside Park Conservancy. Um, forgive me, I actually know Central Park quite well. I don't know Riverside Park. Where, do you know where they typically happen? Um, somebody, Mark was, 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 was um, nodding when I mentioned this. I think, is it around 105th Street? Mark, I think that there's a series of concerts. Maybe somebody else knows. Oh, Jeff may know. Is Jeff still with us? Jeff? Yeah, you've got hands up from Jeff and Matt. So yeah. rather than me speculating, yeah, why not go to the source? People who really know. Sure. Matt? Uh, so I'll, I guess, uh, first and foremost, to, to perform in uh, New York City parks, any park, um, you know, it's a fairly simple process. Uh, of going online and just reserving the space through the permitting process. Um, okay. So <clears throat> it also kind of depends on the type for the park that you're using, what you're envisioning. Are you just envisioning uh, somebody standing and, you know, playing uh, a musical instrument and people are walking by and they can kind of listen as they pass or stand for a little while and go, or are you looking for something more um, formal where you would, people would be invited and uh, there would actually be like a space to actually congregate and, and sure. listen. Um, we're also, <clears throat> a lot of things are, uh, I would also recommend, you know, if you do find a space uh, in our parks that are, that works for you, that you would put in a, uh, a permit sooner rather than later because uh, we've had a lot of permits that have um, been rolled over from last year into this year um, because of COVID. Um, so space can be limited at times, but um, I think, you know, our permitting office would be willing to work with you to find uh, space for you to, uh, you know, have your, your, your performances. Um, so, but there's a lot of, <clears throat> there could be a lot of options. So it's kind of hard to, to say like, oh, this place would be best. This place would be best unless we kind of know specifically what you're, um, envisioning. Okay. So it sounds like we have a little more research to do, but it could be as simple as a walk by concert. We find a good spot. Somebody sets up, we have enough people on hand to make sure that it is safe and there isn't any real infrastructure needed beyond that. If there were good venues where it could even be a little bit more structured, we're open to that. But during the pandemic, we also know that there are people that are hesitant to have outdoor crowds gather. And so something unplanned, unannounced 
may be better suited to make sure that it was a manageable size, but I can go online. I assume you're telling me to look at the um, Park Conservancy website? No, so if you go, <clears throat> uh, even the permits for, for Central Park are done through, so if you go to the uh, New York City Parks website, um, Parks there's, Park, a, yeah. there's a tab that said, there's a tab that uh, uh, is, <clears throat> there's a permits tab uh, and you can click on that and it'll, you can pull up any park throughout the city and it'll give you a list of different spaces that you can perm that you can reserve, uh, for a function or for a concert, okay. um, or any, or, uh, for a variety of different activities. Uh, Jeff might be able to mention some specific ones for, for spaces in Riverside. Um, but for like, for example, the uh, uh, outside of Central Park for the Upper West Side, uh, there's been performances in, at Dante Park before and Richard Tucker, um, you know, very small, like, you know, uh, uh, set up where people can just walk by and enjoy music. Also, Verde Square has been used before. Um, the Parks Department does have some band shells. You mentioned Marcus Garvey. Um, which is also, which is outside of uh, uh, Community Board 7. Uh, also outside of Community Board 7, there's a band shell in Jackie Robinson Park. Um, that could be a great place to have uh, a performance space. Um, so there's, you know, there are definitely options. Okay. Um, so Thank it's a matter of looking at what's available. Thank um, you. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, Dan, just to clarify, while the Riverside Park Conservancy and the Central Park Conservancy do programming for their respective parks and they do a whole lot more as well, I think that Matt is exactly on point here that it's the Parks Department itself, New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, you look at their website, follow Matt's suggestion of looking at permits and that will sort of cover your universe for you most directly. Thank you. Uh, Jeff is the manager of Riverside Park, so you have your hand raised. You're next. Yep, Jeff. Jeff? Are you mute? There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. So Matt's exactly right. You need, um, just so everyone knows, you need to go through the permit process first. Um, what you do is you, you know, you register and you go in and there's a, uh, usually a, a $25 fee, which is not much, but sometimes it was even get waived. Um, but the important thing is is speaking with our permit um, folks um, at at our headquarters in Arsenal West. Um, Riverside also has a permit person that that we go through as well, um, and that that's the beginning of the process. And they'll help you, Dan, go through like location. So um, so that's that's the the first step in, in doing it. Um, also, uh, I, you might also mention something very important that um, during COVID times, you want people to be safe. So uh, I know that in Riverside Park, we've asked uh, you know, for safety plans uh, from folks who are, who are doing uh, concerts um, in the park, like sort of what you mentioned, like small classical concerts, not something big or, or, or high, you know, with like hundreds of people, but anything more than 50 people, if it could draw more than 50 people that, that can be a concern uh, in these COVID times. So, um, so it's good to have a safety plan. Um, and as what you mentioned, uh, we wanna make sure that people are, 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 if they're stopping to watch, that they're remaining uh, socially distant um, from one another. And, and sometimes when you get these concerts, people kind of crowd in a little bit. So um, families, it's one thing, but just people, strangers, you know, mingling back and forth, we wanna make sure that there's someone there to let them know um, if you're not part of your immediate family to, to remain socially distant uh, while you're there. So, um, so you know, all of that's that's good to know. Um, and and the locations um, are usually places that are are good locations for concert. Uh, you can't just set up anywhere. Um, so I know some folks are, are mentioning like playgrounds in the chat. Um, playgrounds are not a good place typically for concerts um, because again, there are restrictions. It's a playground, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's got area use restrictions mainly there for the kids to play in. 
And so that's another thing that's important to understand is that, um, you know, some, some folks think, hey, this is a highly trafficked area. I'd like to set up here. But that can pose a problem because it is a highly trafficked area. And, you know, you might be inhibiting um, people for uh, traffic flow or something like that or even emergency vehicles for that matter, if they needed to get through. So these are all things that you, you'll go, you could talk to the permit office and they'll, and they'll go over um, with you on that. So, um, but all in all, I mean, what you're talking about is, is very doable. Um, you just have to start the process. Sure, thank you. Uh, thanks, Dan, before we go on, I just wanted to call your attention to the fact that in the chat, which you might save at this juncture before the meeting ends, Mm -hmm. um, there's a number of people who have some very interesting things for you, including some websites and Peter Arnston, who is the executive director of the Columbus Amsterdam bid. And he says that he has spaces on the weekend. So um, please okay. do save the chat. And Mark, you're next. Thanks. And I'll try to add without repeating. Um, and, and thanks for the guys from the Parks Department for those good ideas. What I was going to share, and it's actually not that different in concept from what Erica Gerson put into the chat, which is that um, I was at a um, at Lincoln Center, a food distribution venue was set up there with Food Bank NYC and members of the New York Philharmonic, who I think are equally hurting for opportunities to perform, uh, came and performed on the plaza for the folks online waiting to get the bags of food. Um, there are food distribution centers all over the Upper West Side, as well as the rest of the city. Um, Erica's idea was uh, outdoor diners who are, God bless them, uh, uh, risking frostbite to support our restaurants. Um, so sort of the same idea, different audiences, um, but, but wouldn't it be great to combine those things? And since those are moving targets, they don't, um, uh, in that people move along the line, a, you reach an audience without having to have them congregate in one place, and B, um, how great to support uh, folks who are doing the right thing by either our restaurants or um, being uh, uh, finding help when they need it. Um, anyway, so uh, thought, uh, if you, uh, I'm happy to share thoughts of where you can find those kinds of venues offline. We can talk later, but that was the idea I wanted to share. Mark and Stephen, um, it's particularly apropos of what we were just talking about, and in fact, specifically saying to Dan about the chat. Is our chat from any meeting, this one or any other one, publicly available after the meeting? I mean, if Dan wanted to go and look at tonight's chat, this part of tonight's chat, would he be able to do that? It is saved, um, and we are uh, one of the many things that we've uh, hired um, Beta NYC to do for us is to make it available on our website eventually. Uh, we're not there yet, but that's in the plans um, uh, and it's paid for. So we should get that, uh, get that done at some point. Um, but meanwhile, it is saved and it is, you know, so on demand, it's available. Okay, great. Um, Dan, do you have any other questions for us? Because I think this completes the... Nope, I'm just grabbing some of those details from the chat right now. Okay, I thought I saw you looking, looking at your screen, Dan. That's a good thing. Thanks, yeah. thanks for your presentation. Thanks for yeah. Yeah. tonight. Thank you for having me. Okay. So um, what we have on our agenda every month, although we don't always have discussions on these things, is updates on committee business and new business. Um, I have, I'm in the process of putting together the most depressing news on one of our issues that is so depressing and complicated that I'm not going to talk about it tonight. Um, so does anybody else have any quick updates on any other, and we've, uh, we've actually overlapped a bunch of our other, uh, issues tonight, uh, the cameras and some other things. Anybody have a, an important update tonight or, um, or a new business thing quickly? Well, I, I just wanted to remind everybody that I sent you a flyer on the environmental justice oh, webinar. Yeah. And I invited anybody who wanted to attend it on February 25th to, do so and make a report at the next month's meeting, and but nobody responded. Um, is there anybody who thinks they might want to do this? I'm not able to do it then. What time is it on the 25th, Barbara? It, I know it, I saw the flyer, but it's at six o'clock. It's one hour, six to seven. 
I can't remember if I, I can try. I can't remember if I have anything scheduled again. Um, um, Polly, I see a hand up. Polly, is she volunteering? Yes. Great. That was fabulous. You're Did elected, Polly. And at our next meeting, you'll give us an update on that. If, okay. If, if you think it's timely or we need to be paying attention to it sooner than our March meeting, by all means, let us know. Okay. Um, you have all the information. No, can you send it to me, please? Absolutely. Yep. Glad you joined us, Polly. Um, <laughs> uh, Susan? Uh, well, first of all, I'm glad that Polly's here. Polly, welcome. Great to be on committee. Thank you. Um, and then just if, so people know, the snowy owl is still in Central Park and hunting every night, sometime between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. Um, the show starts. Looks um, like he's hunting you and your I was going to say, I think it's in your apartment. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's from Jones Beach. Is that one of your amazing photos, Susan? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, but anyway, if you're interested in seeing the snowy owl, um, help with the rat population control in Central Park. Um, as I say, the show kicks off most nights between 6.30 and 7.30, and you can get the details on Twitter from Manhattan Bird Alert. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, it's a lot of fun. About 50 to 100 people show up each night to watch this. It's, it's really great. Um, I have a technical question for Stephen, and I guess it's Stephen at this point, not Mark. Um, Stephen had asked us to find a committee Zoom master, which I think was intended so that Mark and Stephen weren't going to be doing what they've been doing, or we didn't have to. We had a resounding lack of, uh, we immediately circulated a request for somebody to volunteer and had a resounding lack of um, volunteers. Uh, Stephen, do we still need that, or are we now doing it in a different way where you and Kristen and Mark are sort of doing that for the committees? We no, still you, you, st you still yeah. need to, we still need to get, eat, we still need to find somebody on your committee that can sort of be a point person and to take a moment. So there's a master host that starts it, and then there's multiple people that can sort of run the tech part of it, which is fairly simple. But right now, Mark and myself are doing for you. And I'll be right. candid. Other committees have found other people that have, you know, have taken on this responsibility. We'll also do some training in the next week or so, so that person can join. But it would be ideal to have at least one, and maybe even two, in case that person did couldn't come. Sort of be the tech person, and uh, yeah, that is something that you still well, need to. Sort of at a minimum, I think we, Barbara and I, should encourage all of our members to take whatever advanced Zoom training. Uh, is available to all of us. Um, and I guess we have to just keep beating up on our members to get a volunteer. I, nobody has raised their hand yet, so. I believe I um, saw a request from Ken, as long as he didn't have to take the minutes. No deal, Ken. Well. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about every month, if I don't have to take them every month? Um, no, I, I'm, uh, if I could get trained, uh, I'd be, if nobody else is dying to do it, I'd be uh, willing to, I'm going, to take the training. I'm going to take the training and I already am sort of fluent, okay. fluent in Zoom, so. Okay. So between Susan and Ken. Uh, oh, we got two. You got two, you got two, two there. Minutes. Ken, I'll, I'll, I'll put a word in for no minutes, but I, I can't. <laughs> oh, no, 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 Stephen. You can't do that to Oh, us. no, I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we solved that. Anything else that either updates in your business that needs to be talked about tonight? Uh, Jeff and Matt, who are still with us, thank you so much. It's always so helpful to have you with us. And we have every committee member except, I think, oh, Elizabeth was here for a little bit, but, and Doug McGowan has not been, for the minutes, Doug has not been with us at all, Barbara, tonight. Okay. But everybody else has been. Is that right? I think so. Okay. We done? I think so. I think so. Barbara, are we done? For I think we are. Yeah. All right, thank you. Great meeting. Learned a lot. Natasha, hello and goodbye. If she's still here. <laughs> I see her picture. your picture. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Thank All you. Right. Good night. Hey, Natasha.